Dinah. Uh, so I want to welcome everyone to be a part of this very exciting uh, session. Uh, to uh, chair this session, it's my uh, privilege today to have Dr. Lowell Kabnick, who really doesn't require any introduction, but he's a, uh, a preeminent pre uh, vascular surgeon uh, and as a chair of NYU Wayne Center in Morristown, New Jersey, and also Dr. Michael Lichtenberg, who is the chief uh, of uh, uh, Arnsberg Vascular Center in Arnsberg Wayne Clinic in Germany, which is one of the largest uh, uh, vascular uh, practices in Germany. Uh, along with that, uh, we also have Dr. Julian Javier, uh, Dr. Vini Satwa, Dr. Nilesh Pallar, Dr. Prag Doshi, Dr. Lafeng uh, Q, Dr. Vai Vai Wu, uh, and Dr. Wayne Zhang uh, help uh, to moderate uh, this uh, session. So without further ado, in the interest of time, I'd like to now turn over to Dr. Kabnik. Uh, to uh, get us started uh, with this very interesting program. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael, you're on. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, also, welcome from my side. It's, uh, it's good that we can meet uh, on such a platform today, discuss uh, not only on Venus topics, but also very interesting topics. Let us, let us uh, start with the debate one. Debate one will be patient with iliac vein inflow obstruction and superficial venous reflux. This will be a debate between those Dr. Kasparis and uh, Dr. Goel. And uh, I would like first uh, to ask uh, Dr. Kasparis to share his screen in his talk, treat venous uh, reflux with ablation followed by outflow treatment. Antonius. Thank you, uh, Michael. And good morning or good evening, everyone. Um, as Michael mentioned, uh, this first debate is going to cover uh, management of patients with combined uh, disease in the superficial system and uh, iliac system. And uh, I'm sorry. And as uh, President elect for American Venus Forum, I'd like to invite you all uh, in March of uh, 16th through the 21st at San Antonio, uh, Texas. Uh, where the 33rd annual AVF meeting will be taking place, hopefully. Now, um, what I'm going to try to, to pr convince you this morning uh, is that in patients with combined disease, treating the superficial system uh, should be done first, followed by uh, evaluation consideration of treatment of outflow obstruction. Now, that statement is not always crystal clear, um, and it depends on several factors. In patients with multi-system and multi-level venous disease, uh, one can argue that treatment uh, should be directed to the pivotal segment involved. But currently, uh, it's not possible to identify what is this pivotal segment. Um, it's presumptuous to expect that complete symptom relief would occur in patients when you treat only a, si a single system or level disease and that partial treatment may also only release, develop a partial relief of clinical symptoms, and these relief may only be temporary. So somebody who has combined disease, treating, let's say, uh, the iliac problem or the saphenous problem may lead to venous ulcer healing, but the recurrence may be due to the not treating or addressing the other problem. Uh, so multiple interventions may be needed in some situations in these patients. But the question here is what should be treated first and what order uh, and what sequence uh, should be uh, managed? And really that depends in my opinion on several factors, one of which, what is the clinical presentation in these patients? Um, and is it a patient who presents with varicose veins or is it someone with a venous ulcer? The other uh, factor that depends is, is what is the severity of disease? And as I mentioned earlier, the severity of disease is not very easy right now, at least with the current technology, to be fully evaluated. But we can tell based on our imaging capabilities, you know, what is the vein that's being um, affected? Is it the saphenous vein? Is it the small saphenous vein? Is it the anterior accessory? What is the diameter of the vein and what is the reflux time? Now, there's no data to show that these have an effect as far as severity of disease. But it's pretty obvious that if a patient has a 12 millimeter saphenous vein with reflux, uh, you know, over five seconds from the groin to the ankle is more likely to be a cause of an ulcer uh, than a saphenous vein that's four millimeters or five millimeters with segmental reflux uh, in the thigh 
and an iliac obstruction or occlusion. So what is the severity of disease in the superficial system? And then what is the severity of disease in the deep system? Is it just a nivel lesion that's present in 30% of the population? Or is it a post-thrombotic occlusion? So when it comes to the situation, when you're deciding superficial reflux versus obstruction, really superficial system, in my opinion, is, is the one that should be addressed first. And I'll give you five reasons why. First, superficial disease is far more common pathology when you compare it to deep venous disease. And reflux is by far the most prevalent uh, pathology compared to obstruction. Now, when you look at the data in patients with, who present with chronic venous disease, you can see over 90% of the patients, superficial pathology is the problem, with obstruction only occurring about 30% of the, uh, the, pro uh, the deep problem occurring only 30% of the population. And in pathology, reflux is over 80% uh, the underlying disease. So in all comers with chronic venous disease, superficial, and you look at multiple papers in the literature, occurs in over 80% of the situation. Deep isolated problem is less than 5%, while combined disease occurs in 10 to 15% of the patient. Now, when you look at patients with most advanced disease, which is venous ulceration, venous ulcers, the, the, by far the most common cause of the underlying pathology there is reflux. So when you have a combined problem in patients, um, I think it's obvious that treating the most common thing that, that causes the most common problem here would be, uh, that we've talked about as being reflux, would be uh, the safest thing to, to go with as far as deciding what to be uh, causing the underlying problem. What about cost and resources? Well, treating a saphenous versus treating an iliac obstruction, you know, imaging wise, usually you just need an ultrasound preoperatively. Uh, the catheter costs, we're looking at around $200. The ancillary supplies is minimal. And most of the situation, uh, this can be done in the office setting, at least in the U.S. Uh, in, in venous obstruction situation, ultrasound can identify the pathology in most, most of the situations, but often people are getting uh, additional imaging, such as uh, axial imaging and on-table IVUS. The stent cost is by far much higher compared to an ablation catheter. And the ancillary costs, including a uh, C-arm uh, is much higher. Uh, most of the times you can do this in the office again, but when you're talking about complex post-thrombotic occlusions, which take a long time with multiple stents, these cases usually are done in the hospital setting, and, and some of these patients need long-term anticoagulation. So overall costs are much higher with venous stenting, making endovenous ablation uh, and treatment of the superficial system a more attractive first choice. How about complications? Again, uh, there are multiple complications in both situations. By far, the most common uh, complications in endovenous ablations are minimal, uh, with DVTPE being the most severe. Uh, but again, in most of the literature, this, this occurs in less than 1% of the population. Um, and when you look at venous stenting, the, the most, dear, the most uh, severe complications would be stent thrombosis and migration. And although these are reported low in the literature, as the number of venous stenting is, occur is increasing out there, the number of these reported complications and increases. So again, as far as um, morbidity in these procedures, by I think endovenous ablation of a saphenous vein is a safer option overall when compared to venous stenting. Uh, let's look at data. And again, when we look at venous procedures, data is pretty scarce. Uh, but with, when it comes to saphenous ablation, it's really the only one that has prospective randomized studies comparing treatment versus no treatment, especially in the most advanced patients with C4, 5, and 6. Um, and there's multiple data out there with long-term follow-up uh, out to five plus years. Venous stenting, again, mostly retrospective studies, single center. There are some uh, prospective studies, industry supported, mostly looking at safety and, and efficacy. So again, endovenous ablation, um, is by far the choice here. So what's the role of treating the superficial system in combined disease and is it safe? I think in the, in the, in the early days, uh, it was fraud upon because of concerns of, of making disease worse. Uh, but the, we have data to show that when you're treating the saphenous system in patients with obstruction, it can be done safely with less than 10% of the patients getting worse. And when you, when you look at saphenectomy in these patients, um, Treating the saphenous vein can be done pretty safely with and is well tolerated. 
How about uh, complications after saphenous ablation in somebody who has an obstruction? Um, uh, Rupagoni and, and Al show that when you're treating the saphenous vein in a, in a patient with obstruction, the, the chances of having a post uh, post complication is pretty low and no different in those who have no previous obstruction. So should we treat the saphenous vein? Should we treat the iliac? Should we treat both? What is the best option? Uh, um, there's really no strong data on this. Uh, but when you're looking at treatment options in patients, I think we're looking to treat a disease with a, uh, with a, a simple intervention, a low cost, a low risk of complications. We like to have level one data and burn no bridges. And I think here, by far, saphenous ablation, in my opinion, is the first uh, treatment option. Um, this is kind of a complicated uh, table here, but I think, in, like I mentioned earlier, uh, you want to look at what the clinical presentation of the patient is, uh, but throughout most of these situations, saphenous treatment would be the first option, um, except in this group maybe, where in C4 and 6 patients, um, since you don't want to have a recurrence uh, and we really don't know what to treat first, treating both uh, would be the best uh, uh, choice. And with that, I'd just like to invite you next month uh, to the Venus Symposium which could, again is going to be virtual like every other meeting uh, in 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Antonio. This was a great uh, overview of the existing literature and the clear standpoint uh, from, from your side. I'm very looking forward now to the, the different opinion. Um, this is given by Manji Goel from Cambridge. Uh, Manji, hopefully you are there and uh, yeah, I can see you perfect and give you a presentation about treat uh, outflow first and then consider ablation. Mind you, great to have you here. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. And uh, thank you to the organizers for the kind invitation. Um, it's a real honor. Uh, one of the few positives of the uh, current COVID situation has been um, the, the ability of uh, meeting organizers to adapt to an online platform and to reach out to new audiences. And this meeting is a, is a classic example of that. So congratulations to the organizers. Um, so uh, you've given me a very tough um, task to try and uh, debate against uh, the formidable uh, Tony Gasparis, but I'm going to do my best to persuade you all that actually everything you've just heard from him is wrong and we should treat the outflow first. Uh, these are my disclosures. So uh, a little bit of common ground, first of all. Um, one of the really interesting aspects of venous disease is that it is not a single entity that we treat. Uh, it is an enormous spectrum of disease. This is what makes it so interesting for us as treating physicians, but it also makes it a real challenge when we're trying to manage these patients. Not only is the clinical presentation different, but actually their anatomical presentation and the patterns of reflux and obstructive disease also varies dramatically. Now, of course, we have many superficial venous interventions, so not only traditional surgery, but thermal and non-thermal interventions. But in recent years, we've really got a, a much greater understanding of the importance of the venous outflow obstruction with better imaging, IVUS, cross-sectional imaging. And for the first time, we now have a tremendous selection of uh, dedicated venous stents available to us. And uh, in addition to that, we have the understanding that with good inflow and good outflow and with these stents, we can make real advances in even quite complex post-thrombotic outflow obstruction, after a little bit of work, recanalization, a very good technical result. So we now have all the options available to us on the table. Um, but the disease is complex, so I don't want to oversimplify it, but, but my approach would be to consider the different aspects of disease, not only the classification, but the different com uh, components. So let's take an example here. This is a patient with predominantly varicose veins and C2 disease. And if we look at the superficial and deep components, I think everyone would agree that this is a predominantly superficial reflux, in this case, a great saphenous reflux problem. So of course, I'm not gonna advocate that we should be stenting this patient. This is clearly a dominant problem. We're not, we're not gonna disagree over a patient like this. However, let's take this patient. So we're now into the CVI, so the chronic venous insufficiency category, C3 to C6. This is a much more complex category, ladies and gentlemen. So we have some edema, we have skin changes. Yes, you can see the visible varicosities, but this patient may well have superficial reflux and some uh, deep reflux, but also some deep outflow obstruction. And I'm gonna try and make some strong arguments why for this sort of person, even though you can see the varicose veins, there is a strong argument for dealing with the outflow obstruction first. 
Now, my opponent also mentioned venous ulceration. Um, now, this is a, a population that I've spent much of my career and life studying and, uh, and trying to improve the care of. And I think what we're understanding more and more is that the role of venous outflow obstruction is probably a lot greater in these patients than we previously appreciated. And again, I'll show you some information to support that. The other comment I'd make is that we need to remember the importance of the, the, the concept of phlebolymphedema. So any cause of edema over time will lead to a secondary lymphatic dysfunction. And if we don't deal with an underlying venous outflow problem, leaving patients with chronic edema, we then end up in a position potentially down the line when the edema is permanent. So my first strong rationale for, for stenting first, um, it's that physiologically and pathologically, it is likely that significant outflow obstruction in a patient with CVI is going to be contributing to venous hypertension. So I'm going to show a little bit of physics, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, which is, which is Poussoy's law. So if you double the radius of a cylinder, let's call it an iliac vein, then you increase the flow capacity by a factor of 16. Well, let's take it the other way around. If we half the radius of a, a, a channel like the iliac vein, then you reduce it to 1 16th of the potential that it had, which is a greater than 95% reduction. So it just adds a different perspective to a 50% uh, stenosis that we might uh, count as insignificant. But we also have some data. So uh, my, my opponent showed some data from Raju and Neglin, who have, uh, to their credit, produced an enormous amount in this field. So this was the study um, evaluating a, a couple of cohorts of patients, including a cohort of 151 patients, where they had outflow obstruction, both non-thrombotic and post-thrombotic, but also venous reflux. And these patients were treated with a stent alone and followed for two and a half years. And it was interesting that their pain relief and their swelling relief was similar to patients who didn't have reflux. In other words, just the stenting alone was adequate for these patients. Um, the second comment I'd make is that unlike major high-risk interventions, I think there's, there's a lot of data out there now showing that stenting is very safe and effective with excellent clinical and technical outcomes. And again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into masses of data, but there are several meta-analyses uh, with studies that have included many thousands of patients that have all shown very good technical and clinical outcomes. I will show the one random. Now, there are other randomized trials obviously ongoing, including c tracks but I'll just show this one randomized trial where 51 limbs were randomized to either medical treatment alone or additional venous stenting. All treatments were successful technically, and the authors demonstrated a significant improvement in uh, patient-reported uh, and quality-of-life outcomes. And these are the SF36 curves, and it's interesting that every single domain of SF36 was better in the patients that were treated with additional stenting. So it's clear that this technology does help um, moving on to venous ulcers briefly, um, yes, there are several studies that have really focused on the superficial venous interventions, but the reality is we haven't really looked very hard in patients with venous ulcers at their venous outflow. Um, so there is uh, some work uh, in collaboration with us in Cambridge that Steve Black has led on in, uh, in London, where we've evaluated patients in the community and systematically evaluated superficial and deep systems and demonstrated a very high prevalence of venous outflow obstruction in these patients in all comers, in, in consecutive all comers. And with a strategy of uh, addressing the deep venous system first and then superficial ablation, very, very high healing rates in these very non-healing chronic ulcers. So in conclusion, um, it's clear that it's common to encounter patients with dual and complex disease. And the more we investigate and the better we understand these patients, the more we're gonna come across these situations. But I would argue that for the reasons I put forward, that the importance of the obstruction is probably underestimated and belittled. And yes, I accept that there are uh, many patients with a, a, a borderline um, non-thrombotic issue. But I think the, in, in the situation with chronic venous insufficiency, this may be more important. And also stenting is safe and effective. So I would suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that stenting first is what we need to do for the best outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manji. Great, great presentation, clear statement. Um, I think we have a couple of minutes, Raj, correct me for uh, discussion now. And uh, this uh, discussion is open now for the whole panel. 
Um, maybe can I start? I would like to start with a question from from the audience, um, Dr. Gasparis. You did mention the um, the Lupa trial, which clearly showed, as Manjit just stated, that the treatment first of the pathology, meaning stent implantation, is the way to go. Could you maybe comment on the, on the Lupa trial from your um, yeah from your perspective? Your mic is not on, Antonius. Sorry. Uh, I think, you know, I concentrated on basically the group of patients that there is not much debate about, you know, the patients with venous ulcers or C4, 5, and 6. And I think there, it's clear that venous, you know, and if you have a post-thrombotic obstruction, those patients, you do not want to treat their saphenous vein alone and wait three months to see what happens. Um, treating their obstruction is, is by, by far the priority there. But that doesn't mean that treating the saphenous system, a 12 millimeter saphenous uh, reflux in that patient should not be addressed at the same time, whether, you know, a week later, or a week before, I don't think it really makes any difference. Um, but here, that's a specific group of patients. And unfortunately, when you look at all comers out there, when our patients are being treated with chronic venous disease as a disease itself that have combined superficial problem and deep problem, those patients are not uh, are, are being treated all over the place. So I think you need to look at what their clinical class is, what is their, is it a nivel lesion or post thrombotic lesion, and kind of make an educated guess based on, you know, the severity of reflux and the severity of their obstruction. And to just say that in a patient that has combined disease with CVD, treating the obstruction is the way to go, I don't think we don't have really good data overall. I'm not talking about a specific a uh, group of patients of C, you know, six, um, because we know very well that there is a, a huge number of patients with saphenous reflux and no symptoms, and there's a huge number of patients with iliac obstruction and no symptoms. So we don't have a test to be able to say this patient with obstruction has is that obstruction is significant, or this patient with reflux has significant disease. Okay, thank uh, you. And, and I'll, I'll just add to that, if I may. I, it's interesting, although we've started on different sides of this debate, I think we're sort of converging to a, a common ground. Um, and the reality is there's, there's, there's great shades of gray and a lot of it is not based on good data and good evidence. The, I think the important thing from my perspective is that we haven't traditionally evaluated the deep system and the outflow um, as much as perhaps we should have done. And those patients with intractable ulcers that are sent back to primary care for endless bandages or wound care centers. Actually, we should be interrogating their venous systems in much more detail. And, and uh, you know, part of the important message here is to evaluate the full picture and then make an educated guess. Yeah, uh, especially, uh, especially because, I mean, when you look at the whole spectrum, over 90% of patients don't belong in that C5, you know, C6 group, so. I, I would make one last comment. Uh, Evaluation of obstruction is very difficult because we don't have a test and in the United States at least we would have to subject them to IWAS or any other modality other than that. To rule out obstruction is very difficult. Even doing a venogram does not give us an answer. And even if we do the IWAS, then we are stuck with the point where you would have to define what is an obstruction 50% or less would be significant for venous disease. So unless we define the obstructive uh, the category of obstruction, it's going to be hard to quantify which patients would benefit, which ones won't. Yeah, and my, my response to that would be, I agree with you, but it's obstruction we're looking for, not occlusion. And obstruction has also got a clinical component. And I think it's important to take on board the symptoms. I mean, somebody with venous claudication, for example, is an obstruction until proven otherwise. And, I think you've got to put together the whole package and, and you know it's not we're not we're not treating lesions in venous disease where we have to develop this thinking approach to uh, the complexity of the whole patient okay thank you very much uh, i think great debate um and, uh, yeah because of time we need to move forward well, thank you thank you very much i, I thought that was a, a great debate a lot of information uh, transpired and we'll see what happens Moving forward, I'd like to welcome everybody again to uh, C3 and my colleagues and friends, and we'll go to debate two, post-operative duplex after saphenous vein ablation is mandatory. Pro will be Victor Kanata, Khan will be Sam Rahimi, 
And I will start off with the pro, Victor Canada from Paraguay. Okay. Thank you, Lowell, to, for the invitation and also to RAC. I met one of you in many of the meetings that we have already around the world. And we will see we will be joined each other in a few months and again after this pandemic stuff already go away. I will share my screen. At the bottom of your screen, if you just hover your uh, I have cursor everything. over. Do you see you, my screen? Yes, yes we can, yes we can. If you can just go into a slideshow mode. Yeah, I will go immediately. Okay, fine. Okay, Beautiful. this is the final thank idea. You. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, when we are treat uh, the Safinus vein from so many years ago when I was a surgeon, I was always just ready to crush the heart, do open the aorta and trying to do everything. Uh, since I've been changing the way that I'm seeing medicine and surgery for so many years, when laser come out, I think this is the new way of the treatment. We have to be just a little bit uh, conservative in the way that we treat it and we will have very good results after this. Um, I work here in Paraguay, in the Central Paraguay of the Varices. Um, we have uh, our commitment trying to give the best approach that we have for the vein disease over here in Paraguay. Um, this is my presentation. Post-operative duplex scan after saphenous vein ablation is mandatory, and they put it in trouble because so many years ago when we started doing that, uh, we thought that the, the scan of the saphenous vein after the treatment or the laser treatment has to be um, mandatory. But right now, there are so many papers that's coming out saying that the trouble with the heat is something that will go away. We could follow with very careful the patient without uh, giving too much uh, trouble regarding about new, um, new duplex scan. The patient will go without trouble. I don't have conflict of interest. Okay, laser ablation of the gray saphenous vein is a technique whose was changing dramatically during the few years. And the endovenous techniques with a grown incision and high ligation are centrally less invasive than the conventional vein stripping and seem to change the way that we're doing things for so many years, from 15 years to now on. From 1999, we have that kind of new treatment, the endovenous laser ablation has changed the way that we do everything. And in starting in the USA and now coming out to all the world, we have um, so many people that are involved in the endovenous ablation trying to make a different treatment to all of our patients. Legation and stripping is always just um, very painful with so many complications and will we be able to change if we do the ABLA well with no trouble for patients? Okay, I've been trying to go to all what's going on already all over the world, and I'm trying to see the ABLS and the UIP guideline regarding about the duplex ultrasound. Um, we have to thinking about the indication, the equipment that we have in our office, the positioning of the patient. We have to have the same reporting of result and qualification. This that's, that's the idea of the guideline. We have to do the same, or we try to have um, the same kind of direction. We are trying to just follow up all our patients. We are thinking about when we're supposed to do the preoperative duplex scan. We have to check the deep veins, checking the common femoral vein, the popliteal vein, the junctions, the main tracts, regarding about if there are some epifacial veins over there, trying to find the anterior if it's already in trouble or not, the tributaries as well as the perforated veins. This is um, some kind of picture that I usually use in my office regarding about how would we scan the patient and see what's going on. We're trying to just see all the trouble of the patient, explain everything, have a very good draw of where are the veins that they are in trouble, and they go through with this picture trying to have them attach it to the history to show in the patient what's going on in the future because all those patients that we have here, they will be coming back forever and ever. This is my final idea, trying to have them very closely follow 
just to show them that the disease, we will be able to stop it if they're coming back and we have a map of and everything set it up for them. This is the way that we do. This is transversal view, oblique view. We check everything on a daily basis. We look also at all the perforators areas, the first, the second, the third, the fourth one, trying to have a beautiful map to what's going on already. When we are coming up to the saphenofemoral junction, we are very carefully regarding about where are the, uh, the epifacial veins, where are the to the profundas, how is the saphenous femoral junction going in? And we have to measure from this ground zero to all the veins and trying to have already a picture to see how will be in the future the ablation. When we are doing an ablation, we have to see in two views, the longitudinal view and the transversal view, how is everything. We have to go with the catheter, the superficial, Vein, and then trying to go near to the junction, then release the catheter for 1 to 1.5 to 2.5 centimeters from the saphenoid of femoral junction. This is the catheter tip, and we are moving the catheter from one side to the other. We have to do and leave the catheter between 2 to 2.5 centimeters distal to the saphenoid of femoral junction. And we have to make sure that during the anesthesia, the local anesthesia, because I usually use local anesthesia, the catheter didn't move. This is another view. We are moving to the saphenofemoral junction. We are trying to advance the catheter and we are trying to measure from the saphenofemoral junction to the tip of the catheter. The measure is just a little bit tricky sometimes in, pre, in obesity patient and patient who have a BMI higher, you are sometimes uh, a lot of um, um, fat that didn't give you a good view of what's going on, but sometimes if you are just give some time, you will be able to do without, without big trouble. The recommendation right now for the guidance is just to leave the catheter tip between 2 to 2.5 centimeters check in the transverse view and then in the longitudinal view and then do the measurement to see that everything is fine before you fire your laser. When, are, when you use the radial tip, it's just a little bit easy because the radial tip has some kind of like a, a bulging tip that will be able to show just a little bit better how is and where is the tip. And the measuring is just a little bit much easier. Where, then after you do the procedure, and this is the point that I will talk, where you're supposed to do the duplex ultrasound. There are so many um, guidelines from the UIP one. There are so many papers that are coming out, but they usually I have to know what's going on because as you are more than aware, we are, I'm a surgeon and I would like to see what's happened with my patient. If we have that kind of problem, we start that uh, the laser treatment is the, the uh, laser able to make the vein away is the same that um, the surgery. It will be not give it too much complication. It will the vein coming back, yes or not. That is the reason when we start trying to see what's going on after we do the saphenofemoral uh, junction ablation. We do two kind of follow up. The first one is the early, and the one is the late. The early one is we check the patient 24 hours to one week after the ablation, and the late follow-up should be done between six months and one year. Then we have mid-term and long-term between two years and five years. What are the duplex findings that you have to see? You have to check in your patient after you do the LDL treatment, the obliteration of the vein, if this partial or total the diameter of the vein. You have to check the inner diameter. And if you obliterate it, if you have a segmental, total, or partial obliteration. Let me see if I'm able to have a video right now showing what's going on. This is uh, me doing the stuff in my office. This is a patient that we do more than one month. If you see that the, the vein has three stages already. The first one 
when I go up, the vein is almost disappearing. From down is just still patent, but we know flux at all. And we have the three stage in this uh, sonographic finding. We saw that the vein is disappeared after between six months to one year, and still have some uh, thrombus inside, some kind of fibrosis that you have to check and see what's going on to see maybe if you have infection, some trouble before. You have to check for the absence of flow, if you have untriggered flow or withdrawal flow. And also you have to measure how is the, the retrograde flow 0.5 seconds to see if you have reflux or if the, the vein was already obliterated after your treatment. What are the details of the treatment? You have to something that we have to make sure in your office and just for the future. You have to see how is the junction, how is the main trunk, how are the tributaries, and how are the perforated veins because you will see those patients later on. The junction, can you have like a, this kind of a definition of how you're supposed to do any J0, J1, J2, since how is the junction and what is the way that you saw in the sonogram. T1, invisible trunk, T0, obliterated, and T2 is completely disappeared. And if you have reflux, you have to check a plus or minus if you still are some kind of reflux over there. You have to make sure that we have something else that we will be able to um, follow through for the future. Then, this is the final idea. Where are we supposed to leave the tip? Are the tip... Uh, um, um, Victor, uh, would you uh, please uh, come to your conclusion? Yeah. Okay, I will go to Okay, the final idea is you have to, with some paper saying that two centimeters are from the down over there to just leave the catheter tip. There is new paper also just come a few years ago from Lowell saying that 2.5 centimeters are the one you're supposed to leave the place, you're supposed to leave the catheter. Then, when we were talking about deep venous thrombosis after or a hit after, where are the idea of the follow up? Those are some papers saying that. This is done by Mark Whiteley saying that routine follow up ultrasound should be done. This one was of Peter Lawrence saying that routine follow up ultrasound should be done. Those are some nasty pictures regarding about the trouble of the heat. One in the longitudinal view, that is transversal view. You will see how big trouble as for all patients when we have that. This is from the radiologist saying that follow up has to be routinely and we have to follow through all those patients very closely. This is from the people from Europe saying that we have to have a routine follow-up ultrasound. Also, the people thinking about from the Journal of Vascular Surgery, this is done by um, Peter Globisky saying that we must have a routine follow-up ultrasound. And this is the guidelines for the uh, UIP. We must have a routine follow-up ultrasound. The final idea is like this. Also, therapy duplex is mandatory to treat a hit three and four, to check the ablation, to check the reflux in other truncal bay, and we have to follow through if this is cost effective, yes or no. But from my point of view, in South America, we cannot, we are unable to charge the patient for the second or third um, uh, scan that we do after the treatment. That's why, I, from my point of view, vote for mandatory duplex. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to do that talk for you guys. Thanks, Lowell, and St. Rack. We will see each other in a near meter. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Canada. Be before finish, uh, Low, I will just to just show Stan. Stan is uh, the the dinosaur that is outside of the Google uh, Google company, showing flamingos with 30 million years ago and a dinosaur. If we don't evolve in the same way that the flamingos evolve, we will go like dinosaurs. We will die, we will never be able to go through. And this is the idea to show that picture. This is me doing my procedure over here in Paraguay. We are moving, in 15 days we are doing the elective procedure. Those are the four um, ABLS that I did already 10 days ago. Thank you very much and this,
Your mic is yours. I will just say. Thank you, Professor Kanata. The con will be by Professor Sam Rahimi, Chair of Vascular Surgery at Rutgers. Hello, everyone. Bear with me just a moment. I want to uh, just take a minute to uh, thank uh, Dr. Dave, Dr. Kabnick for the opportunity to participate in the, the C3 conference. I'm going to argue that the duplex is not mandatory. I have no disclosures. So why make duplex ultrasound routine after saphenous ablation? Well, we want to check the treatment efficiency, efficacy, whether it worked. We also want to investigate for whether we have EHIT. Um, I'm going to argue that uh, it's a waste of resources and that also, for the most part, EHIT in totality is insignificant. So what is EHIT? This is endothermal heat-induced thrombosis from the saphenous ablation. We have four different classes. The class one is clinically not significant. Class two is where there's thrombus extension into the deep venous system with a cross-sectional area less than 50%. And for the most part, the recommended treatment is left to the discretion of the treating physician. Class three and class four, we definitely will treat. Class three, the area is greater than 50% and we'll treat with anticoagulation until ultrasound resolution. And class four, we treat with long-term anticoagulation. This example of one, two, three, and four. So why do we look for EHIT? Well, when we first started doing this procedure, it needed to be investigated. We needed to study uh, saphenous ablations and the complications that could happen. Uh, during this investigation and study, uh, EHIT was identified and then it was studied further. But this is an evolution of medicine. Uh, now we know a lot more about this and what to do with uh, complications of saphenous ablation. So what do we know? We know the incidence of EHIT is very low. Um, we perfected this procedure. Uh, the physicians who do this procedure have gotten a lot better at it. And all comers, EHIT 1 through 4, the incidence is about 3 to 4%. The majority of these being EHIT 2 with an incidence of 1 to 2%. And what is important is that the incidence of PE caused by EHIT is extraordinarily low. So the question is, are EHITs dangerous? Uh, Dr. Kabnick uh, shared with me a short series where there were nine patients with EHIT-2, uh, all monitored with serial duplex. Eight out of the nine patients were placed on therapeutic low molecular weight heparin, and all of them had resolution of the EHIT within 14 days. Interestingly, a chest CT showed a PE in two out of these patients, but they were all asymptomatic and none of these patients suffered significant sequelae. And what we're really looking for here is morbidity and mortality, and, and are we reducing that? So what does this mean? Let's look at thrombus burden. So how much thrombus does it take to cause a clinically significant PE? Nobody really knows, and an EHIT-2 is probably not enough to cause a problem. So why look at vein closures right after uh, post-operative ablation? Uh, well, at this point in time, we know the rate of closure is excellent. In the immediate post-operative period, we have success rate of 99%. So the reason why we look at the vein closure, it's just the way we've done things. And that's the real question here is, do we always have to keep doing things the same way? But also we want to do this because we want to show that it, the vein is closed and it makes us feel good that we did a good job. So why we shouldn't look for e-hits? Well, if you look at the number of thermal ablations that are done, it's a significant number, a very high volume procedure, over 600,000 in the United States. And the incidence of e-hit 2 is at about 2%. So if you start doing the simple math, uh, the incidence of clinically significant PE at 0.01%, it may seem like it's, uh, you know, 60 patients, but in totality, it's a very low incidence. So the number of duplexes performed to find one e-hit would be 50. 
So the number of duplex performed to potentially prevent one PE, which would be may or may not even be clinically significant, would be 10,000. And, and the cost is also very important. The cost of a duplex ultrasound, this can vary $350 to $500. Again, the number of duplexes needed, 10,000. So your cost of preventing one potentially uh, not clinically significant PE is in the millions, three and a half to five million US dollars. So how much can we save? We can save a lot of money, 600 duplexes a year. Um, we could save hundreds of millions of dollars in the US alone. In, in this very important study published in the Journal of Vascular Surgery, uh, the one important thing I wanted to point out here is you have in the results an incidence of duplex ultrasound detected venous thromboembolism after EVA at 0.7%, and that the level of recommendation um, for performing a duplex ultrasound after saphenous ablation is a grade 2C, so a low recommendation uh, from this study. And then other complications of treating with anticoagulation would be the rate of spontaneous major bleeding, which is around 1.2%. So the pool of potential patients who might be put on low molecular weight heparin is about 12,000. And here you can result in at least 144 major spontaneous bleeds, which is probably a worse complication and increasing morbidity by getting the duplex ultrasound. At most 60 patients a year will have a clinically significant PE. However, again, 144 patients with a bleeding complication. So in conclusion, uh, refrain, refraining from mandatory duplex would save uh, millions of dollars. Uh, Post-operative morbidity and mortality would not change. Uh, and the duplex screening in the post-operative period is uh, wasteful and not efficacious. Lastly, um, routine post-thermal ablative duplex ultrasound is a waste of time, effort, and money. So some references, and I just wanted to acknowledge, uh, thank you again to the C3 Planning Committee. Thanks to Dr. Kavnik for his mentorship and happy Father's Day weekend to everybody. And thank you, take any questions. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I do have a question for the, for the debaters, the gladiators. If, if we did not charge for duplex ultrasound, and we did it ourselves or somebody did it for us, would it matter whether we got a duplex ultrasound some? I don't think it would matter. I would like just to, may I address that please? Okay, I'm keep here. It, yeah, sure, inside. keep it short, Victor. Okay, yeah, Saturday morning here in my office, the patient came after a treatment and I have my sonogram machine over here. It's just two minutes turning on, see what's happened, and then make sure that the procedure is well without big trouble. Thank, Thank you. you. Do, do we, do we, are we concerned about efficacy? Are we concerned really about EHIT at one week post-operatively without a patient having symptoms? Some or Victor or both? Um, again, I, I um, appreciate Dr. Kanata's uh, presentation and he makes a, a good point, but I think we have to boil it down to, you know, are we really reducing morbidity and mortality? Again, you, you can do the ultrasound, you identify the e-hit, and then what do you do with that information? You either don't treat it or you put the patient on an anticoagulation and that has its own inherent risks or is the patient really benefiting from it? So it, it may not be a necessary thing and it's definitely worth further investigation. Last question. Should we get rid of, of um, the immediate post-operative duplex, but require one um, in short term, up to maybe three months? From my point of view, I will do it always because um, I have to make sure that the patient is fine and I don't, I'm not in trouble. I don't, it's not a waste of resource for me. I have three uh, sewn machines up here and I have to make sure that the patient is doing well and without big trouble. It's my responsibility to make sure 100% that the patient is fine and without big trouble. And I'm the one who is delivering. If I'm in trouble, uh, I will be the one who get the guilt and everything that the patient is not doing well. Yeah. Thank I, you. I have one, more, one comment 
it's one thing to talk about the cost effectiveness, but the other logic is the clinical comment that if you find DVT, then you end up treating and it's not very good because it causes bleeding is a quite sweeping conclusion that you should not find DVT, otherwise you'll give glow enough and therefore a patient will bleed. But that's an altogether different conclusion and I'm not sure if all, any of us would agree that DVT should not be found for the fear of bleeding uh, because of the treatment. So because that's a clinical conclusion and that essentially says that we should not treat DVT. Thank you, yeah, Dr. Think, Doshi. Uh, Sam, do you yeah, I think that's a, very, that's a very good point. Um, and, you know, again, you know, this was more for debate format. Uh, like the previous debate, um, there is some common ground here. Um, but I think that the EHIT is different than a de novo DVT. And you really have to look at what is the risk of a PE from an EHIT. You know, that's why I brought it up. Yeah. Yeah, Lol, well, can I just say one quick thing and then we'll get done? Or sure, you for, for, for speed, very quick, Steve. Yeah, very quickly. I think in general, yes, I agree we should not uh, do a post-op duplex. The only caveat should be for anyone who is either new to a procedure and has not done it that often, they should see what their rate of complication is. And if anyone's adopting new technology, even though they've been doing old technology for a long time, you just want to know your own rate of success or not success. But aside from Thank that. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, um, for shortness. Uh, and, and I appreciate that, um, especially with the new techniques uh, that are non-thermal. We don't have the same history that we have now. Moving on, uh, post-operative, excuse me, uh, thermal ablation is the gold standard for saphenous vein ablation. The two gladiators will be Ed Mackey, who will be uh, pro, and then Steve Elias, who will be con. Ed? Ed, you may be muted. Turn on your mic, please. Ed, can you turn on your mic, please? All right, I'll start over. <laughs> Uh, the thermal ablation, uh, this is about where the thermal ablation is gold standard. Uh, what I was saying is the gold standard is not a term I've ever really heard used in medicine. Um, so I had to kind of look up, up, but really refers to currency and, and uh, um, how we measure currency. Um, gold has been a current uh, type of currency for, you know, eons. Uh, most things in medicine change over time. So I don't uh, no, if there ever is something that we would consider a gold standard in medicine, but, um, but we do like to use gold to compare our different currencies. Um, so I guess what we're looking at, what is the ultimate treatment? And I would have to say it's right now. So I don't know what we have in medicine as currency, but I would, I thought it'd be the literature and what the literature shows. And mostly in the literature, you have these comparative trials, the randomized controlled trial with multi-center blinded if possible. That seems to be the, the ultimate um, type of literature. And many times the control is a placebo or sham surgery if there's no other good treatment. Uh, but when you, uh, but usually we compare treatments by picking one that's, um, that we feel gives the best results. It's almost, an, I guess, unethical to get, uh, to randomize two uh, people to trials, if one of them, you, if there's a good treatment out there, uh, rather than a placebo. Uh, I think we would be talking about ligation and stripping as the gold standard if it was 20 years ago. Um, right now, I think, um, uh, you know, other than ultrasound guided sclerotherapy, I mean, ligation and stripping was the, the primary, primary procedure we used to treat uh, saphenous uh, incompetence. So um, uh, I don't, so many, there have been many studies then once endovenous thermal ablation came out in 99, or at least that's when it got us FDA approval. I think the first study was published before that. Uh, and laser uh, studies started coming out shortly thereafter. Since that time, there's been multiple randomized studies comparing thermal ablations to ligation and stripping ultrasound guided sclerotherapy. Uh, and uh, so many now that there's also multiple Cochrane reviews that have been performed. 
Uh, I won't go into all the studies with their conclusions, but most of them generally say that there are fairly equivalent results between thermoablation and stripping. Um, and that, uh, but the main advantage is thermoablations have better uh, short-term uh, tolerance, I guess, is, uh, for the procedures. All of them suggest more studies and more consistent measures uh, and longer follow-up are suggested. But in general, uh, those study, there's been multiple studies done to compare that to stripping, which probably I would say was the gold standard. Since then, we've moved on to other uh, techniques. Cyanoacrylate uh, has been the, kind of one of the more common recent ones for non-thermal techniques. And when they decided to study that, they did not compare it to ligation and stripping. They compared it to a thermal technique um, in the V-closed trial. Again, I'm not trying to say compare the results. The results were said that they shared the two procedures were pretty close and maybe a little better tolerated between um, the glue versus the RF as far as pain, but it was uh, fairly equivalent studies. Uh, also, there's the mechanical chemical ablation. Um, and there's been a, there's a review earlier in 2017, which did not find much in the way of randomized trials. But since then, there have been some other trials that have um, come out comparing the two. Again, fairly equivalent results, a little less post-operative pain with the thermal ablation. They said more staining, faster improvement in VCSS, um, maybe slightly more anatomic failure. Uh, and there's another study, again, using randomized clinical trial, comparing mechanical and endovenous thermal ablation of great saphenous vein. Uh, again, very similar results between the two, particularly a quality of life, maybe more failures with the mechanical. <clears throat> the only one that really doesn't fit this is Verathena. And I guess we'll have Dr. Kabnick explain why, but they decided to use uh, a placebo uh, or sham for uh, their treatment rather than another alternative treatment. Uh, but, but, uh, <clears throat> but in general, most studies that are doing done are done today for saphenous ablation are done comparing the new treatment to a thermal treatment. So the control arm is intravenous thermal ablation in my <clears throat> And therefore, I think the control arm is the gold standard. So the gold standard is intravenous thermal ablation. As of today, as new studies are coming out, we're, they're, they're comparing it to thermal ablation, not ligation and stripping. So does this, now the standard of care is a term that I am familiar with in medicine. And I do think just about all these are um, standard of care for saphenous ablation. I think there are still people doing ligation and stripping, but it's become quite a bit less. Obviously, thermal ablation uh, is being done. Uh, Clairvain, venous seal are, are being done, and I have, would not criticize anybody if told me that was their mainstay of treatment, because um, I do think it is the standard care. And at Verathena, of course, I think I do think there needs to be some comparative studies done there to really be able to call that um, uh, equivalent. So in conclusion, uh, the most recent trials are using endothermal ablation as the control arm. Therefore, I think that right now, today, is the gold standard. And it's probably not ligation and stripping anymore. I just don't see too many studies coming out looking at comparing those two. Um, the future may be in the non-thermal treatments, but I'm talking about as of today. That's all I have. Thank you, Ed. Let's move on to the con, uh, Steve Elias. Okay, um, Ed's got to stop stop sharing his screen, okay, so I can share mine. Stop share. There you go. Let me share mine. Share. Yes. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Okay, Lil. Yes. Very well. All right. So how do I get this? Yeah, here we go. Okay. So thank you, Ed, and thank you for reviewing the literature showing that. Um, the thermals and the non-thermals are uh, relatively the same in terms of efficacy and quality of life. So I have the con here uh, that 
thermal tumescent ablation is not the gold standard. Uh, and I have a lot of help here from Mark Meisner, took a couple of his slides after he took a couple of my slides and put things together. So here we go. It's really how you look at it um, when you're talking about what is a gold standard. Uh, and Ed already alluded to this, and I too did the same thing he did. Where does this term gold standard come from? Um, and it really started out by setting the standard for the use of gold salts in patients with rheumatoid arthritis in terms of the medical side of things. Um, in 1979, in the economic literature, that this term came in terms of looking for the gold standard for a compliance measurement uh, as well. Uh, and as Google has said, it's the best, most reliable thing of its type. So that's what I kind of took as what is the gold uh, standard. And our gold standard, at least for um, vein patients, and we've already said this during this uh, talk, some other talks, is we want to improve patients' quality of life. Depends how it's bothering them. So that's what we're going to focus on. What is the gold standard for improving the patient's quality of life? And these here are even patients who have venous ulcers, and you can see that their quality of life is even worse than those with just varicose veins. So in uh, 2020, these are all our uh, things that we have, the thermal tumescence, the non-thermals, uh, non-tumescence, and um, uh, what do you call it? Ed mentioned uh, stripping, but really now we do really a, a modern day inversion stripping with, with tumescence. And uh, let's see really which is what we call the gold standard. Gold standard, we got to see what are we measuring to and what are our criteria. So first of all, in 2020, we already have come to the point that you really need to treat to the lowest point of incompetence to get the best results. And many times that means going below the knee. We also want to use what's safest. That's going to give you your, you know, uh, minimal adverse events, uh, and also we want to tailor what we're going to do to the anatomy and the clinical setting of the patient, as we said earlier in the debate, uh, whether you treat superficial or deep first. First, I will say you do need to have either thermal and a non-thermal together, uh, but the problem is why I'm going to tell you that the thermals are not the gold standard now is because we are treating below the knee much more often. And below the knee, we're concerned with what's going on with the skin and the nerves. Medially, we have the saphenous nerve. Posteriorly, we have the sural nerve. And we also have the, the skin below the knee is, uh, and the veins are much closer to each other. We want to think about um, sensory nerves as well. And then in the popliteal fossa, we're dealing with uh, the tibial and the perineal nerves also. So the gold standard has got to be something that's going to improve the patient's quality of life and do it the safest way possible. And that really, to me, is uh, not the thermals. Um, also, we talk about, you know, where is it in relationship to the skin? I already mentioned that. I think the non-thermals here are better, meaning they're not going to report sensory uh, damage or nerve damage. Um, and advanced diseases, we also said you need to go to the lowest point of incompetence. Here again, the, the thermals are really not the gold standard when you're going below the knee because they have a higher complication rate, which I'll show you, um, and an efficacy rate, which is a, about the same. Both are just as efficacious, but the thermals have a higher um, rate of complications below the knee. So here you had to go down with the thermal, maybe not so bad if you wanted to place tumescence, but here with the, you want to place tumescence in this area, it's going to be tougher. So is this really, is a thermal, like, is gold standard for treating all the way down to the ankle in this situation? Um, so non-thermals, I think, are going to replace it, and I think they really are the gold standard, because to me the gold standard is what's going to improve the patient's quality of life in the safest manner possible. Um, the efficacy Ed already showed you is equivalent, um, but it's more patient comfort when you're doing the non-thermals. There's fewer complications. Uh, you don't have to uh, compromise. You can go down all the way to the lowest point of incompetence. And I think I'll show you right at the end that we can treat safer, more uh, disease states. So here's a slide of Mark Meisner. These are results comparing um, uh, mechanochemical ablation and radio frequency. And you can see at one year, closure rates are not all that significant difference at all. But more importantly here, um, they all have a good improvement in quality of life. And that's really uh, what we're talking about here, both with the, the AVVQ and uh, VCSS. The pain scores, however, in the first 14 days were less in the lower line with the non-thermal mocha than the radio frequency, um, as well as the, and again, the VCSS scores all improved together. 
There's equivalent results. There's another uh, uh, paper, but less less pain after the procedure. So here's the results at um, with the, the glue in the first columns, radio frequency and endovenous uh, ablation. The efficacy rates are all the same. The improvement in the VCSS is all the same, but with the non-thermals, less pain. And I think that's really important. Again, we're talking about gold standard should be quality of life. What's important to patients? Patients is really not, then this is, uh, here shows you they're not what they're not concerned with, slightly concerned, moderately and extremely concerned. And what they're really not all that concerned with is uh, time off of, uh, of work, for instance. And they're not all that concerned with single visit treatment, but treatment that's with these arrows and also with recurrence rates. So I would submit to you that the uh, discomfort after treatment is less with the gold standard, which should be the non-thermal non tumescence and the recurrence rates are um, equivalent, which we've already shown with the literature Ed showed. Uh, nerve injury, we all know stripping was a significant amount of nerve injury. And I'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, and so thermal ablation does have a laser here, 6.7%. Another small saphenous is 4.8%. Uh, stripping, of course. I point out to you, there's been no reported nerve injury with non-thermal. Um, since C6 disease is really what I think the new C2 disease in 2020, uh, we need to go as far down as we can. This article by Kim in the Journal of Vascular Surgery showed that with the non-thermal, there was a better healing rate than with the thermal for ulcers because you could go all the way down. And isn't that our gold standard for healing an ulcer? Is, uh, it, for a procedure is to heal the ulcer. So finally, this goes, if you break it all up into what disease states, and uh, this article here is, is referenced to something I did a couple of years ago, but this is Mark Meiser's slide. He took my algorithm. What he shows here is that these are the things that thermal ablation can treat, these situations that I'm highlighting here. Now, if you look at the non-thermals, there's a lot more blue on the picture here because I think that is the gold standard since you can treat all disease states in the same efficacy, but a safer manner with less pain. So my thing, gold standard is tarnished if you think it's thermal tumescence. You do need both, but I think that the non-thermal should be the, uh, the gold standard at this point because improving the quality of life is the gold standard and doing it safely. So I think it does improve quality of life with less pain, fast return to activities. And you got to think young. You have to think new. Let's not think about the past. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank, thank you, uh, Ed. I have one question, then I'll open it up to the panel. Does size matter? Size, you're talking about veins. Size of the vein, yes. Size of the vein being treated. Correct. Yes, of course, of course, Lowell. I mean, size matters. And in general, you know, I've spoken many times before that when you kind of get up a diameter greater than, say, 10, certainly 12, I would think about a, a thermal technology and then, you know, take the hit. You may have a little higher complication rate. But the percentage of people that we see with uh, veins greater than 10 or 12 in terms of the saphenous is relatively low. So I think the non-thermals can treat the great majority of things. Thank you, Steve. Ed, comment? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I think size does matter, but um, uh, I think, uh, um, you know, thermal ablations do, can treat them all pretty well. Well, thank you, Steve. I, I liked your algorithm. Maybe you might want to add size. Anybody um, on the panel have a question? Yeah. Well, size is in the first. Uh, oh, topic. did I miss it? Okay, thank you. Anybody on the panel? If not, any questions? Raj from the audience. Yeah, I don't think that uh, there are any questions for this uh, particular debate. Uh, so um, I know we're a little bit behind time, so maybe uh, we can uh, move along now. Uh, and uh, as I had mentioned earlier that I was going to change the order a little bit. So now I'd like to uh, introduce the speakers uh, for debate five which is about renal denervation uh, for hypertension. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Sripal. Sripal, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfect. So Dr. Bangalore, is, uh, it's a privilege to have him. 
Uh, he's a professor of medicine at the NYU uh, Langone Health in uh, New York City. Uh, Shripa, glad to uh, see that you are safe uh, in the midst of this uh, COVID pandemic. And thank you for uh, taking uh, the time out of your schedule to be with us on Saturday morning. And Shripal is going to take um, uh, the pro side that resurgence as an optimal treatment. And then I will have an opportunity to uh, introduce another uh, a great um, uh, clinician, Dr. Bakris, in a few minutes uh, as well. So Shripal, floor is all yours. Thank you, Raj. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, actually making this happen as a virtual um, a platform. Um, and it's a pleasure to be debating Dr. Bakris. It's gonna be a challenge, but I'm gonna make a case for uh, renal denervation for hypertension. Um, a resurgence is an optimal treatment. Um, so uh, I don't have any particular disclosures for this particular talk, except that I'm, the, um, I'm a site PI for the radiance hypertension uh, trial of uh, renal denervation. So first, I want to uh, look at, I uh, show some data on renal synthetic denervation and PP reduction. So I think the trials we have, we can broadly ca categorize as uh, first generation trials and more uh, recently newer generation uh, trials. So uh, the first generation trials, uh, this is the Simplicity of Hypertension 2 trial. And uh, this trial randomized patients to renal denervation or control uh, around 49 and 51 patients each. So 100 patient randomized trial, uh, randomizing patients to run renal denervation or control. So important to recognize that in the early trials, there's no sham control. So this is in uh, either the patient got the procedure or did not get the renal denervation. And of course, there was a lot of excitement because we started seeing results such as this. So there was a significant reduction here, as you can see, the change in blood pressure from baseline to six months, 32 millimeter decrease in systolic pressures, 12 millimeter decrease in diastolic pressures with renal denervation. But if you do, then compare that to controls, there is actually no difference, or if anything, a small increase in blood pressure in the controls, we did not get renal denervation. So a lot of hype, uh, which started with the early trials of renal uh, denervation, uh, promising double digit, in some cases, more than 30 millimeters uh, decrease in blood pressure. And uh, of course, uh, then this was followed by a major setback uh, with the Simplicity Hypertension 3 trial. And what happened in the Simplicity Hypertension 3? Uh, this was a pivotal trial for US FDA approval. And um, uh, patients were randomized uh, to renal denervation, but also uh, to a sham procedure. So 364 patients, so just over a uh, 500 patient randomized trial. Uh, Dr. Bakris was uh, integral for this trial. And um, interestingly, what was seen in this trial, if you look at change from baseline to six months uh, for systolic uh, blood pressure, office BP, uh, renal denervation did reduce systolic blood pressure by around 14 millimeters of mercury. But interestingly, what was seen here was there was also a sham effect, a reduction in uh, BP, systolic BP of close to 12 millimeters. Uh, with a sham procedure. And as such, the difference between the two treatment strategy did not meet the pre-specified margin for superiority. So this kind of put a damper. Uh, Franz Meserly and I wrote an editorial for this uh, simplicity hypertension free trial. And we stated in that uh, editorial that the time has come to turn the page on renal denervation for hypertension. But by all means, let's not close the book on this particular uh, treatment. So this was 2014. But I must say there are a lot of lessons we learned from prior trials. And interestingly, the first lesson we learned was that there's actually the distribution of renal nerves around the artery is not as simple as we thought before. A previous simplistic model was something as known on this figure. But we know that it's much more complex and the distribution is more like this, what we see on this figure. So just to uh, delve deeper into this, so if you look at the proximal part of the renal artery, the density of nerves is highest uh, here, but nerves uh, seems to be far, farther away from the lumen. So if you're doing any kind of uh, endovascular ablation targeting the renal nerves, uh, although proximal, there may be more nerves, but it actually is farther away. But as the distal, it's the opposite. The density of nerves is lowest there, the nerves tends to be closest uh, to the lumen. What we also learned from uh, some of these trials was uh, 
the more complete the uh, ablation, uh, uh, potentially there is a greater benefit in terms of blood pressure reduction. So here, the simplicity I put in, I put in three trial, looking at the impact of number of ablation. And as you can see on this slide, the more the ablation, the greater is the blood pressure reduction with renal denervation, and more is the difference between a renal denervation with feature. Uh, and what we also learned was that the more complete the ablation, so if you do renal denervation on uh, one renal artery, uh, say if you do all, um, a fourth quadrant of ablation, and then you also target other renal artery, the more complete it is, the more uh, decrease uh, there is in terms of uh, blood pressure, whether it is office BP, uh, ambulatory blood pressure, or home BP. Um, again, suggesting that more complete uh, denervation may potentially have a greater blood pressure lowering efficacy. And we also learned a few things that happens with the patients with hypertension. So the uh, patients with hypertension tends to um, have uh, less symptoms, so compliance is an issue. So there are a number of things that happened with uh, many of these uh, trials, including uh, less standardization of medications, uh, less standardization uh, study populations, and also procedures. So now uh, we have a number of device changes. Uh, so here you can see the spiral catheter. This is the um, radiance um, uh, uh, hypertension ultrasound-based device that uh, I'm currently involved in. This is a balloon-based uh, device. So we blow up the balloon. This is inflated for seven seconds um, using cold saline there. And this uh, it's an ultrasound-based uh, renal denervation techniques. Then you have the other devices, which is balloon-based uh, electrodes for um, out-of-place uh, ablations, and also uh, other devices which are using uh, alcohol-based uh, renal denervation uh, procedures. And of course, I mean, this is kind of a snapshot of all the trials currently in the works. What we can see is what we have learned from all of these is to target uh, a select group of patients um, and to make sure that the trials are designed in a way that there is a sham control, this is all FDA mandated. And the primary endpoint is not an office BP where there can be variability, uh, white coat effect, et cetera, but it's uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. So um, where do we stand in terms of second generation trials and the results from all of these trials? So if you look at systolic uh, ambulatory blood pressure reduction, renal denervation, so these are all sham controlled trials so in the Medtronic spiral off trial, I mean, these are patients who have simple hypertension, uh, hypertension, they were washed off their antihypertensive medication, randomized to renal degeneration versus sham. At three months, uh, when compared to sham, there was a 5.5 millimeter decrease in ambulatory systolic blood pressure. As a uh, difference uh, uh, compared to sham, it was statistically significant. Radiance hypertension solo cohort, similarly, um, Simple hypertensives washed off of their medications and randomized to renal denervation versus sham. So 8.5 millimeters in ambulatory reduction with uh, uh, renal denervation, 2.2 with sham uh, difference being statistically significant. And finally, this spiral on trial where uh, we targeted patients with um, treatment resistant hypertension. They were all on uh, at least three medications. They were randomized to uh, renal denervation, which is sham, nine millimeter de reduction with uh, renal denervation, 1.6 uh, with uh, sham, but the difference was statistically uh, significant. So what we see from second generation RDN trials is that there is a consistent reduction in ABPM uh, when compared with uh, sham procedures. So, I mean, if you can imagine, this is a gold standard using the sham control procedure to, uh, to actually see proof of concept that the renal denervation actually reduces uh, blood pressure. What we're also seeing from some of these trials is that the response, uh, the BP response continue to diverge over time. So this is spiral on med. So we saw the difference of three months and at six months, you see that the, the difference between uh, a blood pressure uh, between the renal denervation and sham continued to, to diverge um, in both for systolic and diastolic pressures. One of the advantage which has been much touted upon is uh, uh, unlike medication, which is heavily dependent on whether the patient takes the medication or not, the renal duration, once you do the procedure, it's as if the anti hypertensive efficacy of the uh, procedure is, uh, is on all the time. Uh, it, it's not as dependent on uh, patient uh, medication compliance, which is a major uh, issue with patients with uh, hypertension. I am so I'll, 
how does uh, uh, blood pressure reduction compare to uh, um, uh, with uh, renal denervation compared to that of other medications? So here is a snapshot of uh, ambulatory blood pressure reduction with commonly used class of agents. And uh, on the right side, I've superimposed uh, the blood pressure reduction with the renal denervation. As you can see, uh, with the many of these uh, trials, the blood pressure reduction is similar to uh, um, uh, at least one time type of uh, one class of agent, or in some cases, um, uh, it, it may be similar to more potent antihypertensive uh, agent. But of course, uh, what we are also seeing uh, the emerging data is that uh, uh, beyond the primary endpoint of two months, at six months, there is a greater reduction in blood pressure. So uh, there is a potential that uh, the it may be very efficacious in select group of uh, patients. Um, I'm sure Dr. Bakris will go over some of these as a limitation. So we do, we do see individual patient response variability. Um, uh, you know, uh, if you look at patients in this uh, particular trial, uh, the proportion of patients with at least five millimeters of greater decrease in blood pressure, it was definitely greater with renal denervation when compared to sham, but you can clearly see variability even with uh, renal denervation some patients having a blood pressure reduction as much as 30 millimeters, and in a few proportion of patients, uh, there is no decrease, if anything, small increase in uh, blood pressure. Um, I'll skip this in the interest of time. So in the renal denervation uh, trials where patients with simple hypertensives were washed off their medications, it's interesting to, to note that uh, one in four or one in five patients had blood pressure under control without any medication at all. Um, so you can potentially uh, keep these patients off medication at least for uh, a period of time uh, and have the blood pressure under control. So uh, just to summarize, uh, there are a lot of promise. Uh, first of all, we've known from a number of studies and registry analysis that renal denervation is safe and the risk of complication is uh, very low. Uh, and clearly with second generation trials, we've clearly shown that renal denervation lowers uh, BP. And uh, this is a gold standard in sham control trials. Uh, but of course, we need to know whether uh, there is long-term durability of, uh, of these uh, BP reduction. And uh, renal denervation definitely, to, in my opinion, has the potential to reduce pill burden, which is a major issue for patients with uh, hypertension. Uh, but of course, that, uh, the efficacy of renal denervation is variable, so we need to uh, uh, address a few things that uh, uh, are being currently worked on. And finally, will uh, a reduction in uh, blood pressure with renal denervation improve outcomes? So what, where I see the role for renal denervation is that in patients with uncontrolled hypertension, potentially in patients who are intolerant to antihypertensive agents, and potentially as first-line therapy in patients with symp sympathetically mediated hypertensives, uh, such as those in the young. And to conclude, I must say the renal denervation procedure has gone through a hype cycle, we were at peak of inflated expectation with early first generation uh, uh, trials, then went into a, a trough of uh, disillusionment uh, with the simplicity hypertension three. We are now at a slope of enlightenment with this, uh, the second generation trials showing significant benefit and hopefully will reach a plateau of productivity very soon. Thank you for your attention. Thank you uh, very much, Sripal, for that very comprehensive uh, overview of uh, renal uh, denervation. Uh, now it's my privilege to invite uh, Dr. Uh, George Bakris, who is one of the uh, uh, very uh, uh, famous name in uh, hypertension. Uh, he's written more uh, uh, peer-reviewed articles on hypertension than anyone I know. Uh, he's a professor of medicine uh, at the University of uh, Chicago School of Medicine. Uh, and Director of Comprehensive Hypertension Center. So thank you very much for Dr. Bakris uh, for taking the time to be with us this morning. And the floor is well, all thank yours. You. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Sri Paul, for a very nice review. And I just wanna make the statement now that I think a lot of people think that renal denervation doesn't work or it's not very effective or whatever. And as you showed, and as I'll show, that couldn't be farther from the truth. The question is, where do you position it? So these are my disclosures. So let's look for considerations, first of all. Device therapies were originally developed for the treatment of true resistant hypertension, not primary hypertension. 
So true resistant hypertension means you're on three drugs, maximal dose, you're thinking about adding a fourth, and your pressure is still well above 140. There have been in development the devices that you're talking about here more than a decade, more than a decade, not just in the US, but in Europe as well. And frankly, they've gone a little farther in Europe than they have in the US. The primary reason for lack of approval is in the beginning, some safety concerns, and then subsequently, efficacy concerns. And so fundamentally, I think a lot of people, including people at the FDA, believe in these things, but said, look, we really need to see, can they do the job or not? And to the credit of Medtronic, they did everything necessary to really um, answer the questions effectively. But at the end of the day, as you'll see, it comes down to cost. And so you maybe should think about these almost as orphan drugs because they're not gonna be used in everybody. They're gonna be used in the minority people. And the question is, as Shrupal alluded to, who are these people that are ultimately gonna need it? Because fundamentally, just because you don't wanna take pills does not mean you're gonna qualify for denervation. So there are a number of procedures, it's not just renal denervation, Baroreceptor activation therapy is alive and well. There's atrial stretch, there's chemotherapy receptor modulation. There's a lot of things that are being looked at, none of which are approved, at least in the US. Some are approved in Europe, but not even for hypertension, more for heart failure. So I think one has to look at this a little clearer. Now, again, uh, this was nicely reviewed, and I'm just putting these into perspective. But I need to tell you one thing that wasn't mentioned. What does it take to get an indication as an antihypertensive agent from the FDA? In other words, if you go in with a portfolio, how much blood pressure reduction, placebo subtracted, do you need to get an indication as an antihypertensive? And the answer is a delta of five. So if you've got five millimeters or more placebo subtracted, that qualifies as an antihypertensive agent. I think you saw in the best single study is the one in the middle here, the spiral off, because these were people hypertensive on no drugs, that you're getting about a five millimeter reduction in systolic blood pressure. So there's no question that this procedure lowers blood pressure, period. And there's no question it would qualify if it was a pill as monotherapy, no question. But that is not the question being asked here. The question being asked is, does it give you significantly greater reduction in blood pressure in people who don't have blood pressure control? That's really the question. And you know, there's different procedures. Again, you saw this before. Again, you saw this data clearly very effective, blood pressure lowering, not a question. The question is, what is this blood pressure lowering added to? Because in this study, everybody was uncontrolled, but they were on one to two meds. That does not meet the criteria for resistant hypertension. A lot of patients do not want to take three and four meds. And I think a lot of us know that. But is that the reason to do this and how much mileage are you gonna get? Well, based on this, you're getting a fair amount of mileage in terms of blood pressure reduction when you do the procedure on background therapy of two appropriate medications. But is it cost effective? Because that's gonna be asked. And here we look at changes at six months in ABPM and again, this is with the Medtronic's uh, device, and clearly, this is, you get a sustained effect. I'm going to cut to the chase and just tell you, you get a sustained effect, and the effect lasts over three years. So let's understand this is not a transient situation. This will last for a long time. And here, 
about 70% of the group was on two to three meds. Uh, spiral off, I showed you this data earlier. Again, nice reductions in blood pressure. Uh, in office BP, of course, more dramatic than ABPM, but still clearly significant. Now, baroreceptor stimulation, I will tell you, tends to be a little more dramatic. And I've been involved with this as well. And this is more complicated because it involves the carotid baroreceptors and it involves devices that you have to tunnel up. And in fact, just to show you, the original device, the CVRX device, is pretty primitive. It took an hour and a half in surgery to put it in. However, I am still seeing people 11 years later in a follow-up that still have sustained reductions in pressure of 20, 22 millimeters. This is the new device on the other side. I must tell you, in this trial, we did do three patients that failed renal denervation. We got a very nice response. This, you can manipulate this with a magnet. And in fact, the original data on this didn't make it for FDA approval, not because of efficacy, but because the surgical procedure was so long, there were bleeding complications and other things post-op and they did not think it was safe. The procedure now takes about 25 minutes. So things have changed a lot, but again, here you're seeing sustained effect. This is published data going out five years. And as I told you, I have patients that I'm still seeing back a decade later, still with the benefit, as long as you change the battery. And now there's another device, a kind of uh, spring-loaded device, so, uh, changes the geometry of the area in the carotid where the baroreceptors are and actually emits out a response similar to what you'd see with clonidine actually in terms of very profound blood pressure reduction. And that trial is ongoing. And it, just to give you an idea what it looks like. And in fact, here's data very much like what Tripal showed you earlier with the early simplicity data a lot of drama, but the question is, are we gonna see this at the end of the day when the trials are done? And as far as adverse events, dizziness and hypotension are the big one. And as I said, the COM2 is currently enrolling, but I think we need to look at devices in general as to where they fit. Renal denervation, you're gonna get an additional, on average, seven to eight millimeter additional blood pressure reduction. When you add it to two, maybe sometimes three meds, that is not something to sneeze at because if you add a fourth drug with the exception of spironolactone, which is what's indicated, you're gonna get probably about five millimeter reduction. And so there may be a role for denervation in those patients, especially if they are not consistently adherent to medications. Renal denervation is safe. I think the jury's in on that. And it is operator dependent. So the more precise the operator is, and the more he gets into those branches and does a good job of denervating, the better your response is going to be. It's unclear about the duration, but for sure we know three years, you're good to go, and probably longer than that. But it is expensive. It is expensive. Now, the, the, the question here is, what about carotid baroreceptors? Well, people are much less likely to accept that because of safety issues and strokes, uh, but they are effective and they have worked. No devices approved for treatment here. There is a device approved in Europe for heart failure, but not for hypertension. And again, these effects last at minimum seven up to 10 years, but that's also expensive. So the question you have to ask yourself is this, and I'll finish with this. If you have resistant hypertension, 
and you don't like taking drugs, but you see they're working. And now they put you on spironolactone, which is what's indicated as a fourth drug. And you get on average an additional 12 millimeter reduction, 12 millimeter reduction. And your blood pressure now, 138, 140, would you rather do that? Or would you rather have a procedure that will reduce your blood pressure eight millimeters? Won't be quite as good, but you won't have to worry about side effects of spiro. So the question is, if you have primary hypertension, you wanna be denervated or you do, do you want meds? And the BP meds that you would get in terms of combinations, what would you want? So here you go. If your BP was 165 over 95 and you were taking three meds, denervation would get you eight over five to the tune of about $12,000. And we know for sure, because give it four years, it's gonna cost you about 250 bucks a month. If you had spironolactone, which is currently the guideline recommendation, that's $10 a month. And that is gonna give you an additional three to four millimeter reduction over the innervation. You pick. So it's not dead, it's alive and well. I'm very confident there will be approval of this within the year. And I'm confident that a subgroup of people are gonna opt for it. And anecdotally, I will just tell you, I had a lady referred to me who basically, similar to what we put into Simplicity 3, on eight meds, eight meds. And she was taking them because we visualized her taking them. Eight meds, max doses of seven of the eight with blood pressures of 180. We did, now she had advanced CKD, but not ready for dialysis. We did bilateral nephrectomies because she had an elevated renin. And just like the studies in the 70s, her blood pressure now on a single drug is 132 over 80. So it works. Let's not have any discussion about it. The question is, who does it work in and who's the best person for it? Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Bakris and uh, Shripal. Uh, I'm gonna open this up for a discussion. Any questions uh, from uh, panel members uh, for our speakers? Paraga, you are speaking, but uh, your mic is off. Okay, I hope you can hear me a little better. Uh, yeah, now I hear you fine. Yeah. So, based on this, what is the prediction? And I have this question is both for Sripal and Dr. Bakris. When do you think, even for that selected group of patients, the devices will be out in the United States? Well, I'll let Sripal give his opinion. Based on what I know, based on where things are going, I am confident within the year, if not sooner, but definitely within the year, there will be some approval of some process. And to be honest with you, I think where things are right now is they are doing some ongoing trials with larger numbers. I think when those trials are done, if the data are consistent, I think there's going to be some language put forth as to who and where and they're indicated. Yeah, I agree. I think the timeline is uh, one, one and a half years from now. Um, and I think I want to emphasize what, what uh, Dr. Bakri has uh, outlined in, in the talk. You know, we've, we've been enrolling for this trial, but it's very difficult to enroll. So they'll get a and it's very stringent. I mean, you get these patients, you know, we are taking them off their meds, switching them to a single triple pill combo. And of course, I mean, what happened to the triple combo? 60% of them, their blood pressure is controlled just by that switch alone, and they get out of the trial. So it just goes to show medication compliance and being on the right medication makes a difference. And of course, they also undergo CT and you have to qualify the renal arteries after you wear a particular size and so forth. So you can imagine the numbers dwindle uh, from what you think is potentially eligible to actually who finally qualifies. Dr. Kavnik. 
Lol, your mic is off. I really enjoyed both uh, lectures as this uh, area is a little bit foreign to me because I am a, a Venus interventionalist. But that being said, if we look at, at economics and quality gains and some of the things that we experience in new devices, would it be that the insurance companies, forget about approval with the FDA, would the insurance companies support this if it's only a five drop in, and the cost is cheaper with medication? Well, I'll give you the short answer to that. Um, first of all, don't ask difficult questions, okay? Please, these are supposed to be easy questions. Um, <laughs> the, the way I would answer this is they probably would not because for them, and for that matter, for Medicare, to show you a benefit, and I, I know this firsthand because we had discussions with Medicare when we were originally doing Simplicity HDN3. You need to show me that if you use this, you're going to reduce the incidence of strokes, you're going to reduce the incidence of ER visits for hypertensive emergencies, and you're basically going to save them money. If you can show that, they will fund it. Unless you can show that, they probably will not fund it, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I think that's the critical piece because, you know, we talk about medication, compliance is the biggest issue because many patients treat hypertension as asymptomatic condition unless they start getting headaches and then strokes, et cetera. So if the concept of renal denervation being on all the time is actually true, you should show a reduction, even if it is a five, six millimeter decrease in blood pressure and effect on the cardiovascular outcomes. And I think that's the critical piece to, you know, uh, improve uh, uptake by, uh, you know, payers and providers and stuff. So I think that that's definitely needs to be done at some point. Thank you. Great. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Sripal and Dr. Bakaris, uh, for uh, this wonderful uh, debate. Uh, lots of learning. I can't wait for this technology to be available uh, uh, because it's going to be technically very interesting to do. Uh, there will be probably some nuances uh, and uh, we're going to learn uh, a lot as we go along. But I'm now going to turn over to Dr. Kabnik to introduce uh, our next uh, debate speakers, uh, um, uh, Dr. Kabnik. Thank you very much. Um, our next uh, debate uh, will be um, involved uh, post-operative nivel patients require more than antiplatelet drugs. Uh, that will be Swat uh, Dagsini for, from Turkey, a very well-known vascular surgeon. And uh, the con will be from Alan Davies. Again, needs no introduction from the United Kingdom. So. Uh, Swad, if you would start, that'd be great. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Kamnik. I'm sharing now. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Dr. Raj and the organizing committee for giving me a chance to be a part of this great debate lectures. And I have a very difficult opening, so, uh, it, it will be very difficult for me uh, to defend. However, I want to do my best, and I will try to convince you that nivel patients require more than antiplatelet drugs. So uh, as the first picture, I want to start to show you that this green plant of clover, which is the source of uh, warfarin, so why not to use this beautiful plant? But I know that we need uh, more uh, than this to convince you as a scientific base. So I have nothing to disclose. And in order to convince you, I just try to look at the guidelines and this what the society tells us. So first, I look at the 9th and 10th ACCB guidelines. Unfortunately, I couldn't find anything. So there is no mention of anticoagulant and antiplatelet therapy after venous stenting. Then I look at the AHA guidelines, which is published in circulation 2011. Hopefully, I could find two statements about this. And they say that although they have a lower level of evidence, after venous stent placement, use of therapeutic anticoagulation with similar dosing, monitoring, and duration of iliofemoral deep vein thrombosis. And after venous stent placement, use of antiplatelet therapy with concomitant anticoagulation in patients. 
perceived to be high risk of thrombosis. So we need uh, from here anticoagulation as well. And when we look at the CIRSA guidelines, which is published in 2014, th there is also uh, good uh, mentioning about uh, anticoagulation for here, especially for the uh, warfarin with this INR range of 2.5 to 3 is recommended. But uh, when we look in detail, there is no evidence from control studies and extrapolation from the arterial system, which says that platelet aggregation is known to be important in high flow, high shear environment, and coagulation may be more important in the fibrin-rich thrombic characteristic of low flow, low shear venous circulation. Even without studies, strong suggestion that antiplatelet agents and anticoagulations have a role. And I tried to look something specific for May Turner syndrome, and I found this article which was published in 2018 from uh, Dr. David Gar Garcia. And the, in this review article, they could only find five uh, studies, which is only a very limited number of patients of 61. And when you look at the anticoagulant protocol, it is very uh, variable because in the first study, as you see, they used fondoparinux, enoxoberin, and warfarin. And for the last of the uh, other studies, they use warfarin. But in one study, they add aspirin and clobidogrel after the cessation of uh, warfarin therapy. And when we look at the results in the first study, they have the lowest potency rates of 60%, but at the, the rest group, they have the potency rates between 80 and 100%. And the, the group which they add warfarin to the aspirin and clobidogra after the cessation of uh, warfarin therapy, they have almost 69% of uh, potency at one year. And we have this study also, which is published in this uh, issue of Philobology, Journal of Philobology, about the long-term therapy of venous stenting. Here we see that a lot of different protocols, warfarin, enoxoparin, doax, dalteparin, fondoparinux, and more obvious, the most patients also received antiplatelet therapies as well. And when we look at the results, especially in stent stenosis or any bleeding complications, when pe people having these triple therapies, they have the best results for instant stenosis. But when we look at the major bleeding and any bleeding, they have, I think, more complications because of triple therapies. But when we look at only maybe dual antiplatelet therapy, they have 50% stenosis. So I think adding anticoagulation therapy to, uh, anti, let's say, after the stenting is better. And we have some dog studies and combination of uh, dog uh, with especially rivaroxaban with the over, over day taking clobidogrel has a very beautiful result. And also one another study comparing vitamin K antagonists and rivaroxaban so the results, especially the primary potency, looks uh, almost similar to each other, although it is lesser than vitamin K. And uh, a new article published from Masri Group in two, uh, this year, February, which is comparing the low INR and higher INR, INR group. So they have compared this, uh, especially related with the uh, time within the target uh, threshold uh, for the INR. They, and we, in this group, uh, hopefully they have also five iliac vein compression group, which is treated fully uh, either asenokumarol or femprocumon and with the median duration of 500 days. And as a result, they say that and quality of anticoagulant therapy reflected in time to, uh, within the uh, target threshold following a venous stenting procedure is important and independent uh, risk of instant thrombosis. And each 10% lower TTR were associated nearly 35% increased risk of instant thrombosis. And now what does my right honorable opponent, Professor Alan Davis says about this? In, an, in one of their review articles, they say that thrombophily is associated with non-thrombotic chronic venous disease, although the mechanism is unclear, but from this, review article, we can understand that patients with even nimble patients can have some uh, thrombophilia and adding an anticoagulant may be better. And as a final, we know this international therapy consensus document again, which is done by Dr. Alan Davis. And as a statement one and statement two, he says that anticoagulation is preferable to antiplatelet therapy for the first uh, six or the 12 months after stenting a non-thrombotic may turn lesion. And also, lifelong therapy is recommended if anticoagulation is stopped after stenting a non-thrombotic maternal patient. 
So as a final remark, I want to show this picture because we were last uh, uh, January in India WICOM meeting with Dr. Uh, Ellen Davis and I think it was one of the last face-to-face uh, -face meeting that we had together. I hope soon we will be come uh, again after this uh, COVID and the pandemic. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that. It was great, Swat. Uh, next, I will turn it over to the Khan, Professor Alan Davies. You're on. Lil, thank you, thank you, thank you very, very much. I think it's very important very important when we're considering these patients as to whether we're considering patients who have had an open repair or an endovascular repair. It's very important to think about these patients as to whether there has been any previous evidence of VTE or whether it is a lesion that is identified post a VTE. But uh, uh, as my colleague said, we want to very much focus on nibbles, which are symptomatic really with no previous history of VT, VTE. So what of the evidence? You, we've already heard a little about the ACCP and NICE. The answer is there's no clear guidance with respect to patients who've had no evidence of a DVT. I think we'd all agree that we'd want to follow the specific pathways for those people who've had a DVT. All we can do is make a best guess from looking at some of the coronary literature or the peripheral arterial disease literature as to what people have done with respect to anticoagulation and antiplatelets. But ladies and gentlemen, the one thing I would say is it is still a mess as to what you should do. Now I'm going to talk about some of the evidence and the evidence I'll talk about will be similar, but I'll use some different papers as well to actually try and give you a flavor as to where I think things are. The nice thing is I'm actually talking to you about something in which there is actually no evidence as to what the best thing to do is. And if we were to look at all the participants here, well, there will undoubtedly be those of us who are biased, have our own prejudices and do our own things. And when I tell you what I do at the end, we'll see that I'm completely biased and prejudiced. But if you want to look at this review by Mark Meisner, and I accept these include patients who we would probably all accept are at higher risk, those who've had a VTE, and post-thrombotic lesions, there really is no good evidence from his review as to whether you should even use anticoagulation or, or antiplatelets with respect to maintaining stent patency. Again, there's an, another paper by other colleagues from 2015 that comes up with the completely opposite concept that you should be using a DOAC and antiplatelets. If we look at this very nice paper that separates those patients with the post-thrombotic syndrome those who previously had a deep vein thrombosis and the Mayferna syndrome, you can see that in the three groups, again, they say that stent patency is not related to anticoagulation or the antiplatelet regimen, but the only factor that is important to consider is that of the actual diameter of the stent. If we then want to look at a, a further paper here, very clearly illustrating in a number of patients who've had iliocable stenting, Again, they suggested very clearly that there was a benefit from the use of antiplatelets that were the best predictor. Alan, can we just interrupt you? There seems to be a problem with your presentation. Your slides are not moving forward. We don't see the slide show, actually. Ah. Okay, I'll, let, let me just go back. Can you just hit slideshow? I, I'm on slideshow and they're all moving forward here. Let me go back and I'll go back to Zoom. Lowell, can you see anything moving forward? Yeah, uh, I am the same way as you are. I did send you a message. So now let's see what happens. I think it was a con his connection. I think so. Okay. Can, can, you see, can you see some things? Can you see any slides now? Yes, yeah, we can see you, number five on now. Yeah. Can you put it on your presentation mode? Yeah, I'm just doing that now. Yeah. Can you see the slides now? Yes, we can see just fine. Okay. I'll 
I'll, I'll carry on. I apologize for the, the um, that problem. Basically, again, another study showing that antiplatelets are the best predictor of outcome. If we look at this study from St. Thomas's Hospital that did include some patients who had Maythonis syndrome, they very much advocated the use of low molecular weight heparin and warfarin, no to DOAX, no to antiplatelets, but completely acknowledge that the evidence is poor. We've already talked a little bit about some of the Dutch studies that are out there. And what is interesting, if you look at these reviews, it's very clear that th their thoughts are that the antithrombotic regimen does not influence outcome, and have a, but do postulate that anticoagulants may be better than antiplatelets, but actually that the operator factors or the size of stent, again, are more important. So the take home message I'd very much want to g give you is that even in high risk cases, anticoagulation does not seem to be of any benefit. If we then look at one of our own studies reviewing, again, people with acute DVT, you can see we come up with a slightly different view that anticoagulants and antiplatelets do seem to be of some benefit, but there is no idea as to what the optimal regimen would be. But again, no good evidence. Now, I'd like to take you through this Delphi study that we did in a little bit more detail. And I'd like you to look at case one. Case one was a 25-year-old man with a swollen leg, varicose veins, but no previous or family history of a VTE, and was having treatment. I, are you look? I'm looking. Are you what? What slide can you see? I, I see antiplanar therapy is associated with stent patency after iliocaval venous stenting. So that's a slide number eight. If you go into a presentation mode, uh, it should uh, move forward when you click it forward. Raj, eight. I think it's his internet connection. Uh, yes. Alan is very well experienced in, yeah. in oh. webinars. So I think it's the I'm internet sorry. connection yeah. that's a problem. Okay, no problem. Okay, we carry on. Thank you. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll carry on and I, I apologize um, we, we published a Delphi study taking three particular case scenarios, which was previously mentioned. And the one that I wanted to highlight to you was a 25-year-old man who had a, a swollen leg, varicose veins, no previous history of VTE, and was to go undergo treatment of a May Turner syndrome with stenting. All went well. And then people were asked as to what they thought you should do with respect to anticoagulation. 29% suggested that you should use six weeks of low molecular weight heparin and warfarin, but no antiplatelets. 16% suggested antiplatelets for 12 months, lifelong and nothing else. 16% suggested DOAX for three to six months. 7% suggested DOAX for six months and antiplatelets. But the key thing is that there was no overall consensus about what agents you should use, but the vast majority of people felt that you should use an anticoagulant. But the point I would like to emphasize, and I apologize that the slide isn't there, is that just 50% oh, oh, uh, of people advocated the use of any antiplatelets in the management of the may Turner syndrome. If we then look at case two, which was a patient who had an iliofemoral DVT and underwent stenting because, because after the thrombolysis, a May Turner lesion was identified. Again, there was a complete variety. There were over nine different answers that people gave with respect to treatment. They all would agree that you needed to have anticoagulation. However, there was absolute confusion about duration and the use of any adjuvant agents. If we then look at the third case, which was a patient with a leg ulcer and a chronic iliac vein occlusion secondary to a DVT, there were then 14 different options that you could actually recommend with respect to the use of various medication. But the majority of people were suggesting that you should use an anticoagulant. Warfarin was the most popular, followed by DOAX, but there, it was very clear as to how long an agent should be used for which I find slightly surprising because for certainly my own 
practice would be for anybody who has had a deep vein thrombosis on two separate occasions would be to offer them anticoagulation for life. You then have three statements and uh, Suat very kindly showed you two of the statements and statement one, anticoagulation is preferable to antiplatelet therapy for the first six months after stenting a non-thrombotic lesion was statement one. Statement two was lifelong antiplatelet therapy is recommended if anticoagulation is stopped after stenting a non-thrombotic maternal lesion. And statement three, which is applicable here, is that low molecular weight heparin is the anticoagulant of choice in the first two to six weeks after venous stenting. If we then looked at the Delphi survey to look at consensus, statement one, which was the use of about antiplatelets, there was there was no consensus as to whether you, there was no consensus to, with respect to anti, there was consensus with respect to antiplatelets. However, lifelong antiplatelets, there was no consensus and there was consensus about the use of low molecular weight heparin. So ladies and gentlemen, I think there's quite a lot of good evidence for the use of anticoagulants, but not really for antiplatelets. So I would like to pose the question to you all, do antiplatelets actually have any role in the management of nibble patients? So is the question of the debate actually wrong? So I, in summary, I'd like to suggest to you that there is no randomized data or observational studies really to prove one way or the other about post-procedural anticoagulation. Most of the work is cohort data and overall the evidence for what we should do is very weak. We haven't even commented because the question was about what we should do and didn't focus purely on drugs. We have no idea what the optimal surveillance regimen is, and we have no idea as to what the optimal regimen is with the, the advice with respect to asking people with respect to depression. So I would very much like to summarize, and I'm afraid you can't see the slide. There's a picture of me with my arms open wide saying, I don't know, with, with a slide very much emphasizing to say that we're all biased. And a lot of what we do is actually to avoid us being sued rather than for what we actually know is to be best for the patient. So my final penultimate slide, if we were actually going to a vote, is whether you can agree with the motion, disagree with the motion, but I would suggest to you all that you all need to abstain because there really is no good evidence one way or the other. Thank you very much. And I apologize that you've only heard me rather than seeing the slides but I'd be more than happy to share the slides with the organizers if they wish to distribute them to any members of the audience. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much, much Dr. Davis. Uh, I, I would love to have your slides. I think that I can uh, marry the slides post-production uh, with your uh, lecture very easily. Uh, thank you very much. Any questions from any panel members? Yeah, I, I have a question for uh, the panel. Uh, this is Vinay Satwa, and great job, everybody. Uh, wonderful talks, and I think that the the key key issue here, like everybody said very eloquently, is is that really there is no guidelines, and we're basically you know going off of our clinical experience. Uh, my question for the panel is: um, oftentimes, you know, many of these patients that present with nivel lesions, many of these are young women, premenopausal, uh, still having their menses. And we often encounter women after having their stent placed, we do place them on anticoagulation, um, but many of them come back with heavy menstrual bleeding, uh, so much so that it's, you know, it takes them out of their daily, daily uh, work life. So my question is, has anybody encountered this problem with heavy menstrual bleeding due to other antiplatelet or anticoagulation therapy? And then if so, do you make any adjustments as far as uh, how long you anticoagulate them for? Well, I, I think the the answer is yes, and I think you, I think as you've seen, the evidence is so poor as to what you should do. I think the answer is you, you can actually reduce your antiplatelets or anticoagulation, or give decide to give them nothing, depending on how far you are out from implantation. I've got one or two patients who, and I accept this in quite the, but who've had their whole IVC and both highly extended, who ha have ended up on various other medication because we've decided 
that they really did need to stay on anticoagulation. And we've also, in a, a small, in two of them actually, in, had the, they've had IUCDs to actually reduce their um, bleeding. So I, I think it's something that you need to discuss with the gynecologists and with the hematologists to decide what's best for the individual patient, because we do often think about giving them some different hormonal therapy as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else? Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, both uh, great uh, speakers, uh, great debate, a uh, very interesting uh, and timely information. Uh, now let's uh, continue with our uh, agenda. Um, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, all the attendees. Uh, uh, we have just crossed uh, over 3,000 now. Uh, this morning um, from uh, China, uh, muscular surgical uh, colleagues, as well as uh, US and European uh, physicians and the physicians in Asia. Uh, so thank you for taking the time to be with us. Uh, now we are going to move on to uh, uh, challenges in vascular interventions from uh, China. Uh, Dr. Bain Zhang, who is professor of vascular surgery at University of Washington, uh, is uh, with us, who is an ambassador of C3 uh, in the country of China uh, and uh, has uh, been an integral part of the Scientific Advisory Board of uh, C3 Congress. Uh, so he uh, will um, uh, take the lead in uh, presenting our uh, Chinese speakers today. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Wayne Zhang. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Davi. Uh, thank you. For this great opportunity, you know, organizing this uh, uh, C3 and China uh, combined uh, webinar. So, so far, great program and uh, really enjoying the earlier talks. Next, so we will have uh, a session from China and we'll have uh, two panelists uh, Dr. Ye Zhi Dong, who's the uh, chief of vascular surgery from uh, China Japan Friendship Hospital in Beijing, and Dr. Wu Weiwei is a professor and chief of vascular surgery from Tsinghua University. And then we also have uh, three great speakers uh, from China. The, the, they're going to share the uh, ch uh, challenging Venus cases with us. Uh, let's welcome the first speaker, Dr. Ye Kai Chuang from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. And uh, he's going to uh, present a case uh, PTI sustaining. Dr. Ye. OK, thank you. Let me share the mode. Do you see the slide now? Yes, we can see fine. OK, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Professor Dao, and uh, thank you, Professor Zhang. Uh, my honor to be here today. Uh, good morning and uh, good evening to uh, experts from the panel and uh, all to our uh, audience. Uh, I want to share a case of about uh, of uh, post thrombotic occluding, uh, uh, and uh, I also want to share some tips of the standing and stand choice. Uh, first, uh, this uh, patient was uh, a fifty-seven years old man. Uh, who was presented with uh, severe swelling and, and uh, active uh, ulcer in the left lower extremity uh, for five months. And uh, actually, he had, uh, uh, had a deep venous thrombosis in bilateral legs uh, about uh, 15 uh, years ago. Uh, usually, before the procedure, uh, I'm ascending a venography uh, from the dorsal vein of the foot uh, shows, uh, shows the uh, patency of the femoral uh, vein and the popliteal vein, but uh, the laying extended from the common, from the common femoral vein to the uh, inferior vein carrier. And uh, usually in our department, uh, the patient was asked to be in a prone position uh, and uh, uh, after successful popliteal vein puncture, the venography from the sheath also shows the occluded uh, inferior, uh, iliac, uh, iliac femoral uh, vein with uh, collaterals. Uh, 
uh, a gut wire and a supporting catheter uh, was used to get to uh, to get through the occluded veins. And the uh, venography from the catheter, uh, make sure the catheter located in the true lumen of inferior uh, venous cavity. Uh, before the, uh, the stent de de deployment, uh, we usually perform the uh, balloon angioplasty uh, with small caliber balloon uh, and uh, first and uh, followed with a larger caliber balloon. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, stent deployment uh, uh, was uh, mandatory, uh, but uh, usually, uh, usually we posted uh, delegate delegation after the stent deployment uh, was performed uh, after the uh, stent deployment, and uh, also the final venography will show the. Uh, Will show the pendency of the stent and uh, also uh, the disappear of the disappear of the uh, collaterals. Uh, oral anticoagulant uh, therapy uh, was used after the procedure. Uh, the swelling on the swelling on the left uh, uh, lower extremity re relieved uh, rapidly, and also the uh, ulcer healed. About uh, four weeks after the uh, procedure, we also perform the uh, ultrasound uh, examination to show the pendency of the stent in the first uh, first mouth after the procedure. And also, we usually perform uh, the CT uh, uh, venous CT angiography uh, about uh, six uh, months after the procedure. You can see the pendency of the uh, stent. Uh, we, we also the the, the venous CTA also showed the stent structure. We can see the this is the wall stent stent. The structure was was in good condition, and there was no thrombosis uh, in the uh, was detected in the stent. So this is the uh, the, uh, the uh, general uh, procedure of the patient who was treated with uh, uh, stent placement. So I want to. Uh, Share uh, with say, share some uh, technical tips about the procedure. Uh, the first one is how to puncture the excess. We usually there there, there are many uh, puncture sites uh, during the procedure, such as uh, femoral vein, peripheral vein. Uh, we also perform the puncture site puncture access under the guidance of uh, uh, real time angiography. Or, uh, uh, or, or under, under the guidance of the ultrasound. The, the second detail I want to describe is that the stent must cover all the legends of the ilia uh, femoral veins. Uh, we, we, we usually divide the collaterals into two uh, types, outflow collaterals and the inflow uh, collaterals. Uh, usually the outer collaterals of this uh, collaterals should be covered and the inflow collateral should be uh, preserved. Just like uh, this, this is the uh, inflow arteries, we should preserve these uh, uh, veins. Also, in some cases, the laying involved the uh, femoral vein, just like uh, these two cases, the uh, femoral vein also included. Uh, however, we 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 uh, we, we don't uh, recommend it. Uh, the stent should uh, actually uh, stented the standing into stented the stenting into the femoral vein was not uh, recommended. Uh, but uh, we just uh, uh, deploy the stent uh, in the uh, common uh, femoral vein. Also, in some cases, uh, with the filter bearing I, uh, inferior venous cava occluding, uh, which is one of the uh, most common complications after a filter insertion, uh, actually, recanalization of the occluded IVC filter and the stent placement through the filter, uh, we, we think it's uh, very feasible and, and also very safe. Uh, also, if the patient uh, presented the uh, uh, presented uh, symptoms uh, in bilateral uh, legs. The procedure of a uh, peroneal stent uh, was uh, uh, recommended. 
uh, yeah, uh, of course, we we don't have sufficient uh, evidence about the best type, uh, best type of the Venus stand. Uh, yeah, actually, we only have two types of uh, Venus stand in China: uh, Illuminix from BD company and also the wall stand, which is the most common used in China for Venus disease. Uh, but from the CT angiography uh, uh, examination. We can we can see we can see from this uh, uh, pictures the wall stand had a circular structure. Only the wall stand have this uh, uh, circular uh, structure. Uh, also, just uh, some experts just uh, talked about before uh, anticoagulant therapy after stent uh, uh, deployment, and uh, uh, it's very important to to avoid the uh, stent thrombosis. Actually, the incidence of uh, instant occlusion is not rare. Uh, but uh, in, uh, instant uh, occlusion was also can be treated uh, with uh, balloon angioplasty and uh, standard placement. This is uh, uh, a typical uh, case who was uh, who had the uh, uh, stent uh, occlusion and can also be treated with uh, uh, balloon angioplasty and standard deployment. Thank you. That's all. Thank you very much, all the difficult cases. Uh, any uh, questions or comments from uh, the panelists? Oh, okay, uh, thank you, uh, Kai Chuang, uh, I, uh, for your excellent uh, showing us the difficult cases. I know uh, in your hospital have rich experience of venous disease, including PTS treatment. So I do agree with uh, most of the, uh, your idea to uh, actual side and path through the strategy. My question is, uh, what's your strategy for post-operative anticoagulant? Did you do anticoagulant only or anticoagulant and plus antiplatelet and hope for how long? Thank you, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Zhu Dongye. Uh, it's a very good question. Actually, in our uh, vascular center, we uh, describe uh, anticoagulant only for patients with deep venous thrombosis or previously uh, deep venous thrombosis, just like a uh, patient with PTS. But uh, in patients with non-thrombotic uh, uh, iliac layings, we only describe uh, the describe uh, anti antiplatelet for one year thank you thank you so any other questions if not i have a question for you uh, dr Yue. so uh, I, you saw a picture and you published a paper on european general vascular surgery and if you have a clot inside or below the filter so you still can pass a wire and a stand there right did you do that yes actually yes. okay now my question is you know you you, you push and the stand the filter and uh, what about if you have recurrent uh, uh, dvt and your filter is not working right so uh, and uh, you can theoretically have a clot kind of flushed into your primary uh, you know, primary vein cause of PE. How do you anticoagulate this? And uh, you are not, you, you choose not to remove the filter, just stand inside, right? Yes, uh, thank you for your question. It's a very good question. Uh, actually, we we never put, uh, in, uh, deploy stent uh, through the filter in patients with acute thrombosis. We only use the stent placement for uh, post thrombotic uh, uh, accruing. So uh, usually there was no uh, uh, thrombosis in the uh, filter. So uh, it's, it's safe to insert the stent through the filter. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, because, you know, we kind of behind, uh, we just move on to the next speaker. Uh, Dr. Li Donglin from Zhejiang University, and uh, he's going to talk about uh, contralateral iliac uh, vein occlusion after it could stand across the uh, uh, iliac cuba complex. Dr. Li. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Zhang, and thank you for all the uh, panelists and all the audience. And uh, can you see my slides? 
Yeah, we, we stay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, today's my topic is about the uh, contralateral iliac venous thermosis after stenting, of course, the uh, uh, iliac cavern confluence. I think this situation is um, is uh, quite not so common, but it happens. And uh, uh, whether the, the contralateral VT will happen. Uh, let's begin with the case. Uh, this is a DVD case. Female, 63 years old, complaint is left leg edema for two days. And the ultrasound uh, diagnosis is DVT in the uh, left ilia vein and also the common femoral vein. And then this is our venography. You can see that the, it's patent in vent cover and the left femoral vein. But we can find the uh, uh, thermosis in left uh, common femoral vein and the left iliac vein. Uh, we uh, conducted a uh, uh, thrombectomy using angel jet. Uh, after the whole procedure, we can find the left iliac vein compression. It's occluded almost late. And uh, we uh, conducted a PTA and then uh, we put a wall stent uh, 1490 in the left common iliac vein. And uh, detailly, uh, what, during the uh, venography, we can see the picture, see the details. The proximal uh, end of the stent, actually it touched the opposite wall of the vena cava. Um, but uh, the uh, right iliac vein is patent. Th this is the process of the procedure. So the uh, stenting across the whole vena cava, uh, iliac cava confluence. After the stenting, we use uh, the anti-thrombotic treatment with uh, rirazepam and aspirin uh, two together. Uh, and the patient recovered smoothly. Uh, but uh, after three months, the patient stopped the drugs by herself. And uh, even that, uh, she uh, uh, often sitting there continuously with, with very less activity. And uh, after one year, the right leg edema, and she came back. Uh, the venography shows that the left elastentic is patent, but the second picture shows us that the right iliac vein thermosis. So uh, the contralateral, the contralateral iliac vein or it, it, it does happen. We uh, conducted a manual thrombectomy with the guardian catheter. And uh, after the thrombectomy, the uh, venography shows us that uh, the uh, thermosis is, uh, is uh, most of the thermosis is um, uh, respired, but some remains. And also, we can see that the stem mesh is colluded. Because the, uh, uh, the right iliac vein is colluded, so uh, after that, we put a kissing stent, uh, also another wall stent in the right iliac vein, and uh, use a balloon to prostate it. Yeah, this is the uh, last venography. You can see that the iliac vein patent, the both sides are patent. So uh, this is the answer to the first question, also the title. Uh, where the stenting across the iliac vein confluence will uh, influence the contralateral iliac vein flow? It's uh, possibly yes. Uh, actually, uh, in many situations, we uh, the stents, the, the proximal end of the stents, uh, we, we will put there um, a little bit higher, uh, and sometimes it will touch the wall. But uh, not every case will, will show this kind of uh, contralateral, uh, contralateral thermosis. So in what situation uh, it will happen? Uh, this, uh, this data is published in 2018 
and uh, uh, the they studied the incidence of the contralateral DVT uh, after stenting uh, in patients with only methanol syndrome, and uh, uh, they defined it uh, three three locations of the stent. First one is uh, the end of the stent extended to the vena cava. The second one is only covered the confluence. And the third one is just confined to the uh, uh, epilateral ila vein. And the first one, first one uh, touched the uh, world, the IVC, uh, they define it, it will induce venous intimaplasia. And the second one is uh, also called jelly. And uh, the, uh, the, the whole, the whole uh, cohort is um, 111 patients. And actually, contralateral DVT happens in 10 patients. And during the 10 patients, seven from, uh, from type 1 with uh, venous uh, uh, intimal hyperplasia, and two from gelling. And the last one is unknown. The, uh, the anti-thrombotic treatment for all the cohort is uh, warfarin or rifazabin for six months and a lifelong antipalate. Uh, these uh, uh, are the typical cases. Uh, this, this is uh, for the uh, uh, type one, which is touched the wall of the IVC. And uh, this is uh, type two, just the gelling. I will not show the uh, details. And uh, they also found that there's no differences with stents. We can see that there's uh, one stent and uh, other stents. Uh, there are no differences between the type of the stents. And uh, they conducted a risk factors of analysis. They found that uh, there are two risk factors. One is the proximal of the stent extended to the IVC. And second one is long-term follow-up. We can see that the follow-up the fo the follow -up time of the, in the uh, DVT patient, the mean time is uh, 73 months. And uh, protective factors is just confined to the common ILA vein. So here's their conclusions. Uh, they think that the incidence of the contralateral DVT is relatively high, it's about 9%. And the causes of this situation is uh, overextension to the IVC and uh, uh, together with venous intimal aplasia. And when will this happen? They think that it usually happens late during follow-up. So uh, uh, this is the uh, answers to to the, to the question two. And uh, here's another study which was published in 2014. Uh, they also focused on the incidence of contralateral ilia vein thermosis. Uh, just in uh, DVT and PTS patients, uh, another cohort. And uh, the enrollment of the study includes 41 patients who receiving stents that extended to IVC, uh, just to focus on this kind of uh, situation. And during the 41 patients, uh, there are four patients uh, come up with the results of uh, contralateral DVT. The incidence is quite similar, about 10%. And uh, the only risk factors they found that is uh, anticoagulation compliance. This is only one. Uh, this, this is the, uh, the contralateral ilia vein pattern C. And uh, the whole follow-up is not too long. And the mean follow-up is is 10 months, uh, 0 to 30. And we can find that most of the uh, contralateral DVT happens. The start time is from ninth month. It's, uh, it's quite short. Uh, here's their conclusions. They think that contralateral DVT 
uh, is anticoagulation dependent. If uh, uh, if pa uh, in patients with um, uh, the maintained standard an anticoagulation is uh, protective factors. And uh, if the patient uh, is not so compliant with anticoagulation, so uh, the contralateral DVT will happen soon. Uh, so uh, how contralateral DVT will happen? I concluded that there are several factors. First one is overextension of the stents to the IVC, and which will induce venous intimal hyperplasia. And the hyperplasia actually is time independent. It will, it will not happen very fast, uh, usually uh, maybe several years. And the uh, hyperplasia will cause stasis of the bloodstream. And uh, besides that, if, uh, if the patients receive uh, inadequate anticoagulation or uh, or the patient has uh, hypercoagulability, the, which will induce the process of the contralateral DVT. So this is uh, how to avoid uh, that situation. Uh, we should uh, precisely locate, uh, relieve the stents. We should make a precise location. The, uh, the stents, should of course a little bit of the confluence, but it should not be extended to the world of the IVC. And together, besides that, enough anticoagulation or even sometimes prolonged anticoagulation is necessary to avoid that. So here's the conclusion, final conclusion. The contralateral DVT after stenting across the iliac cavern confluence, it really, hap it's, uh, really happens, it's possible. The incidence is time dependent because the venous intimal hyperplasia needs time and enough anticoagulation is quite necessary. Otherwise, the contralateral DVT will happen soon. So the precise location of the stent is necessary. It should of course a little bit of the confluence but not extended to the IVC wall. So thank you for your attendance. Great. Actually, this is not uncommon and a very, very important uh, issue. So we have to deal with. Uh, I would like to ask the panelists uh, to hear your experience or questions. Yes. Uh, very, very interesting uh, lecture. And thank you very much. I have um, another thought process with, with uh, this problem of jailing or intimal, what you call intimal hyperplasia. But one of the things that we talk about are flow dynamics. And flow dynamics are very important concerning outflow and more importantly, inflow. So as we limit our obstruct flow uh, from the native iliac vein because of jailing or um, uh, neo-intimal hyperplasia, um, we also have to consider inflow. So have you looked at inflow problems in this small cohort of patients? Obviously, if we anticoagulate um, the blood like water, we can get anything to flow, but that's, that's only a, a helpful aid, but it has to do with flow dynamics. And my question again is, have you looked at inflow problems with these patients? Okay, thank you for, for your good questions. And, uh... Actually, this is only one case I have just met. And in this patient, the inflow is quite good. Uh, the venography show the patent uh, femoral inflow and also the uh, uh, external ELF uh, inflow is quite good. Just the, actually, this is the problem with the outflow. So Dr. Lee, how do we know um, I know in the United States, we're wrestling with this, this problem of how to judge proper inflow. We don't have any objective measurements other than looking at ultrasounds and, and looking at some numbers that we're looking at in terms of flow dynamics, or we're looking at radiology, venograms and saying, yes, 
it, it does go fast uh, through that area. But are, are my Chinese colleagues looking at this in terms of being able to measure or come up with an objective number for inflow? Uh, yes, and uh, the, uh, the uh, examination of the inflow is uh, not only by one means. And uh, uh, in this patient, we only use uh, ultrasound and uh, venography. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's um, uh, how to say, it's deep, uh, the, uh, the, the flow dynamic is, uh, maybe it's um, because of the patient, she uh, walks not too much and uh, often often lay down there. So this may be another problem. I agree. Thank you very much. I have one more comment. So the amount of jailing of the contralateral is perhaps partially related to the fact that the wall stint, we don't exactly control where they end and we tend to overextend it to the IVC. With the newer Vinova as well as the other stents that are already coming, do you think that we don't need to extend it much in the IVC beyond a couple of millimeters because of more precise placement, so we don't have to worry about a contralateral iliac because of that? Sorry, I, I didn't catch your question. May you pardon? So my question is because wall stents are harder to control, we extend it more in the inferior vena cava. With the okay. newer stent, we know more as well as other stents, which are very precise. Do we even need to gel the other iliac and just leave the stent a couple of millimeters beyond the ostium, so other iliac pain is not affected at all? Uh, okay, I... Uh... Uh, the oral stent, I think, and the oral stent is um, just a little bit different from other uh, uh, stents because the actually the, it's not so easy to quite precisely locate the proximal part of the stents. So, uh, so usually we have to make the stents a little bit over the junction. So. Uh, uh, in uh, in some situations, we uh, the head of the stents uh, this is quite near the IVC wall, uh, so the relief of the stents needs some uh, needs some skills. Usually, sometimes we will do the venogram from the another side to make sure of the uh, opposite wall, and uh, yeah. Uh, if you put the stents uh, just confined to the uh, FC lateral, sometimes it, uh, it cannot cover the uh, lesions. So this, this is the, the problem. One last uh, comment regarding uh, the extension of the stent. The studies that you quoted are quite contrary to the studies that were done by Raju. Uh, who always recommended putting in the stents all the way into the iliac, and he did not see any difference. So I think the studies that are giving two different results, we have to see which stent is the right way of putting the stents in. And the second one is, if it's intimal hyperplasia, I mean, the designs that we have, even if we use the current uh, uh, stent technology, you will be jailing the other side, as Dr. Doshi was talking about, because of the pressure, veins are not uh, that hard. So even if we put the stent right at the junction, we still would not have the same effect as we have in the arterial side. So that jailing part will occur, intimal hyperplasia will occur, so the design probably should be very different than what we currently have in the market, is to have a bifurcation, bifurcated stent to place in if that's the only reason why we get all these things. So there's a lot of unanswered questions as of now, as I can see it. And hopefully future studies will help us through those things. May I have Thank a you. comment? Yeah, quick question from Dr. Ganassi. Uh, when we talk about the wall stand, you know the weakest point of the wall stand is the tip, tips of the stand. When you, when you put the wall stand just, uh, if you don't go across a bit into the IVC, the stand have a residual compression under the right iliac artery. 
That's why we are for moving forward into the IVC. And then you look at the Dr. Raju series, in order to exclude this, they, they made a Z stand modification. They, they made a Z stand was modification to make it stronger and to make the stand more open cell to uh, co exclude the contralateral jailing. And if the Dr. Lee showed us that there are also some contralateral DVTs with the dedicated venous stents, but I think this is mostly related with the stenting technique. Those, the new dedicated stents has more radial force, especially at the tip point. So for the newest stent, you don't have to go too much into the IVC. And if you combine your technique with the IVUS, you, you should uh, stent uh, at the exact point without, uh, let's say, jailing the contralateral side. And that is one of the important points to combining the IVUS in our practice to exclude the contralateral jailing. It's, it's an important issue. Not only the stent, but also the stenting technique is very important. So, and I agree with the anticoagulation. It is really important. But first, we should make our, let's say, stenting technique is uh, much more excellent. And I think it's very important. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Very important uh, comments. Uh, let's move on to the last uh, talk. And uh, we have a Dr. Li Henghe uh, from Chongqing University, and uh, he's going to present a case of um, sub-Q ileo, uh, iliofemoral DVT treated uh, with, uh, you know, um, uh, MPD. Uh, and and uh, this is uh, due to iliac mean compression syndrome. Dr. Li. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for Dr. Zhang, thanks for Dr. Dewey, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, today, I would like to present a case of iliac vein compression syndrome with a subacute iliac femoral deep vein thrombosis treated by pharmacomechanical cancer directed thrombolysis combined with stenting. And uh, uh, he was a 57 years old male. His <laughs> chief complaint is re recurrent swelling of the left lower limb after fracture fracture for more than one month and relapsed for 22 days. From the physical examination, we could see the tension of the left lower limb was high and the left lower limb was swollen. And the ultrasound results show that this patient suffered from the venous thrombosis of the left lower extremity. It's a complete area femoral population type. And also this patient suffered from a great sapphire vein thrombosis of the left lower extremity which means that the collateral in the uh, left lower limb may be very poor. So uh, from CTV, we also can see the, uh, the whole area and the, the whole area of femoral vein was not also enhanced in the CTV. And uh, uh, the, which can be shown by the right order, we can see the vein was compressed by the artery and the bone uh, compressed obviously. So, uh, the diagnosis of this patient can be uh, established easily on the basis of ultrasound and the CTV. The first one is deep venous thrombosis of the left lower extremity. The second one is maternal syndrome. So for this patient, the difficulty in handling is the course of DVT at, at, at least more than four weeks, which means it is a subacute to chronic face thrombosis. And the key to treatment is whether we can clear the thrombus uh, removed uh, effectively. So before the operation, we uh, puncture the left popliteral vein with the uh, ultrasound guidance and in the operation, we insert an inferior vein cover filter through the right femoral vein and the angiography from the left popliteral vein showed obvious uh, collateral branches from the popliteral vein to the femoral vein and the femoral vein lumen uh, was occlusive totally. So uh, we could also see there were a lot of fading defect in the femoral vein. And the first we use a six millimeter and 10 millimeter balloons to delete the femoral and the iliac veins. So uh, after that, we perform crossover gradually from the right femoral vein to the left femoral popliteral vein and below the knee peroneal vein. So why did we do that? Because we could see there were a lot of thrombosis around the puncture area in the public So we must, uh, we must uh, make sure we can clear the thrombus in the public uh totally. So we must uh, recreate uh, access uh, in the distal public uh, wing. So we chose a uh, perineal wing. So, okay. 
uh, again, from the angiography, it can be seen that the cyst area in the popliteal vein was full of thrombosis. So we punctured the perineal vein with the guidance of the guide wear in the perineal vein. Uh, the guide wear is from the right femoral vein. Then we established the perineal vein through the inferior vena cavity oxide. So now we have three puncture sites. The first one is a uh, right femoral vein. The second one is a uh, in the uh, left popliteal vein, which for the previous PTA for the uh, uh, for the uh, iliac vein, uh, iliac vein PTA, which can make the across easier. And the third uh, third exercise is the main operation uh, success uh, exercise. So we re remove the cyst in the popliteal vein first, and we perform PMT with uh, angiocet six front dilantic. So first, we injection of thrombolytic agents, uh, we use a Uconide for about 200,000 uh, 200, units. And we wait for about 20 minutes outside. Uh, the aspiration was performed for about four minutes. Uh, so after PMT, the angiography was as, as follows. We could see the whole popliteal vein and the femoral vein was patent. Also, the popliteal vein punctual side with uh, some bleeding. And uh, uh, we also can see the femoral and the atac vein. There is uh, some residual thrombus uh, in the uh, vein wall. And the PTA was performed again with six millimeters and 12 millimeters blowing. And after blowing, the blood follow of the popliteal and the femoral and uh, also the atac vein was significant, significantly improved. So we chose to perform CDT for another 24 or uh, 48 hours. So after for about 20, uh, 48 hours symbolizes the angiography was just like this. We could see the blood follow in the popliteal vein and the femoral vein was uh, very good. And also in the femoral atrial vein, it's good too. But we can see, which we can see the uh, comprised, comprised the proximal atrial of uh, common atrial vein was com comprised obviously with points by the uh, right arrow. So we performed PTA also we, from the Zulmai picture. We also can see uh, there, is a, uh, there is an island in the center of the wing. So we pre performed PTA again your, the, with uh, 40 millimeters and 12 millimeters below installation. So after that, the blood follow in the popliteal femoral and the iliac vein seems a little bit better. Uh, then uh, a smart control, uh, which was uh, 40 millimeters plus eight millimeters and a wall stent 12 millimeters uh, plus uh, 90 millimeters uh, put in the iliac and uh, femoral vein, which across the lumen. So after that, we could say the blood follow in the whole wing of the extremity is very good. So we, the IC, ICVA, the filter was, was removed. So we can see the last two pictures. After first operation, there, uh, the patient suffered from a late so swollen in his left leg. And after the second operation, the, the whole leg is recovered completely. So that's my case. Thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Excellent cases. Uh, questions, comments? Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Great job and congratulations. My question is that uh, uh, this is a, a typical uh, double acute DVT cases. And uh, uh, on your experience, what is the uh, result of the superficial femoral vein uh, for those patients with subacute DVT after the uh, PMT and the CDT treatment? And uh, if the uh, if the superficial femoral artery venous is not uh, get enough inflow, uh, what how what's your strategy? I mean, what's your treatment strategy to to evaluate the inflow and uh, how to ensure the patency of the iliac stent if you stent it? Okay, uh, thanks for your good attention. So. Uh, we can put some uh, we can put two stent in the iliac and the femoral vein because we can ensure the in follow and out follow is patent. So if the super super if the uh, super femoral vein is occluded, all the thrombus in the uh, femoral vein is not clear enoughly. Maybe we will not put stent in the iliac vein. 
So maybe we can take the uh, some uh, CDT again, or just uh, so that's why we chose a uh, uh, eight friends Galante, not a six friends uh, so 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 okay. That's it. Thank you. Okay, so uh, maybe I have I have question or comments uh, because this is subacute uh, uh, physics of uh, DVT, and uh, the patient had a history of menses. From my own experience, I have seldom to treat it in this long thrombosis. We cannot do using uh, thrombolysis with so good uh, effect. So sometimes what I want to do was uh, uh, optimal uh, medical treatment for anticoagulant and waiting for at least uh, six months later to see if it is PTS, then we treat it. If the uh, other, we just follow up. What I want to know what about the panelist uh, idea about this subacute uh, DVT. Okay, how about the, the opinion of the panelist? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, any question? Uh, you know, comments of any? Yeah, I I think subacute is a controversial area, and uh, if I'm going to treat it, I would treat it early on. The longer we wait, it's very unlikely, unless you are thinking of only the pelvic vein issues then I think waiting and doing just the pelvic vein uh, venoplasty and stenting might be an option. But when it's uh, iliofemoral, I saw that you did a long segment thrombolysis, and that's the question that has not been answered even with the TREC trial, that how we are going to treat the segment from popliteal or femoropopliteal segment. So it is a controversial issue, but if it's young patient with a lot of complications and problems, I would probably treat them early on. Okay. Any other comments, questions? Uh, if, if not, uh, you know, I'll give this back to Dr. Davi and uh, for like uh, closing remarks. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Uh, great, uh, great session, uh, great attendance, a uh, lot of interest, superb presentations, uh, tremendous cases from China. Uh, so with this, uh, I'd like to uh, close the uh, webinar of today. I want to thank all of our moderators and the faculty members who took time out of their uh, Saturday morning to be with us. Uh, and uh, Dr. Wayne Zhang, especially uh, very, very early in the morning, and our, uh, our faculty from Europe uh, who uh, practically had to uh, uh, disrupt their middle of the day uh, to be with us. So thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Victor Canada, also in uh, South America. Uh, a fantastic session. Once again, uh, looking forward to see you all in uh, future sessions. Uh, have a, a great uh, rest of the weekend. Uh, thank you very much uh, for everyone's participation. And thanks, uh, Ryan and, and the team in China who has done a great job in uh, technically uh, setting uh, uh, this uh, webinar up today uh, for uh, C3 China. Thanks again, and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank thanks, you. everybody. Have a good weekend. Bye. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Thanks.